<laughs> All right. I think we are live. Check in our chat room to make sure we have we have affirmation from our chat room that they can see us and hear us and all is good. We'll wait for that one moment. Yep, there's the confirmation. So let's start this show in three, two. This is Twist. This Week in Science, episode number 765, recorded on Wednesday, March 18th, 2020. Who has the Mars maps? I'm Dr. Kiki, and today we will fill your head with virus, crocs, and flies. But first... Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. If you went outside today and you're not essential staff, why? Maybe you haven't heard... We are in the midst of a global pandemic. A virus has gone viral, despite not getting any likes. So we all need to come together to fight it by staying as far apart as possible. <laughs> and while the world is reeling from the reality that nature still exists, that we are still very much connected to nature, and that even the smallest form of life, a life form that doesn't even check all the boxes for the normal definition of life, can bring about consequences that shut down civilizations the world round. One thing that can't sh be shut down, that's right, it's This Week in Science, coming up next. I've got the kind of mind that can't get enough. I wanna learn everything. I wanna fill it all up with new discoveries that happen every day of the week. There's only one place to go to find the knowledge I seek. you kiki and a good science to you too blair and everyone out there welcome to another episode of this week in science we are back again with more science to fill your mind that's right to suit all the curious thoughts that you've had that's what we're here for and that's why we love coming back every single week this week Justin has been trying to join us, but his internet is not cooperating. He's out on a on a farm in a bus, so I don't know. Maybe he'll join us at some point during the show if things come together, all of the electrons align. But until that time, we are going to have a great show no matter what. I have stories about... COVID-19 so that we can talk about some of the, the big news that's go gone on, the science for the last week, and also some transplanted limbs. Blair, what is in the animal corner? Oh my goodness. I have um, erasing memories. I have crocodiles. And uh, for the very end of the show, I actually have some positive news about the coronavirus. <laughs> we have time. Fan Fantastic. We like positive news here. Let's have a little bit of positivity and optimism mixed in. We also have a melting T-Rex with us this evening. We are going to start our show with an interview with Dr. Fred Califf III, and uh, he will be talking with us about mapping Mars, which is very exciting. Whether or not he remains in T-Rex form certainly does depend on the strength of the batteries in that costume. <laughs> yeah, it's all about the electrons. <laughs> it's all about the electrons. Okay, as we jump in, I would like to remind you that subscribing to the Twist podcast on your favorite podcast platform, YouTube or Facebook, is going to bring you Twist each and every week. That's right. Every time a new episode is published, it will come to you because you're subscribed. So search for This Week in Science or visit twist.org. Now, it's time for the science. Okay, Fred Califf has a PhD in Mars geology. And according to his Twitter bio, he works with Insight, the Mars Science Lab on Curiosity, and the Mars 2020 mission at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, mapping landing sites in return for food. Is this, is this what the way that they pay you at NASA? <laughs> food. Rawr! <laughs> um, yeah, okay, 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 the joke was fun. 
Um, yeah. <laughs> You know the amazing thing about dinosaur costumes they don't tell you is that they have humans inside. Um, they're also very hot. <laughs> they're very warm, aren't okay. they? <laughs> Suddenly a human. It's it's Such like a, it's like it's like a no. butterfly emerging from a chrysalis. Yes. Oh my goodness, the the scariest butterfly I've ever seen. Um, anyways, um, <laughs> you're welcome. Or, yeah, thank you. Um, anyways, um, yeah. So I'm a geologist by training. Um, but I was always into mapping. It's kind of the skill I have uh, to do my geology, looking at fresh impact craters on Mars. And uh, yeah, so I got I came to JPL um, about eight years ago and worked on landing site analysis for the Curiosity rover. And from there, got hired onto the mission uh, to do mapping to help track the rover, as well as um, every place that we do science. Whenever time we find a a rock on the ground. I uh, do my best to always have a rock in hand. I'm a geologist, right? Um, right. To uh, let's see. Oh yeah, there's. Is a that is right that here. a regular rock or is that a Mars rock? Um, I wish it was a Mars <laughs> rock. No, it is a regular rock. It's a piece of granite from my hometown. Because um, I grew up on a piece of granite pluton. Actually, that's really true. Um, anyways, um, long story short. Um, yeah, so I'm there and I, so I work on the various rover missions. Um, I've also worked a little bit on InSight and basically anything going to Mars, I try to, I'm more or less involved, um, on the surface things. Nice. And on your bio in, uh, for NASA, it says that you are the keeper of the maps. Yes. What does that mean? <laughs> what does that entail? <laughs> um, I take all the maps from the team and I stick them in a box and I say mine. No, um, <laughs> I uh, basically it's it's keeping track of um, helping keep track where the rover is every day. Um, so every time the rover moves, we need to find out where it went. Um, it kind of keeps track of itself, but if we don't tell it where it actually is, um, it forgets. So like some days it's like I'm here, and we go no, you're over here. Um, uh, because if we didn't do that, eventually that over here would be like a kilometer away. So I help make sure that base map is um, assembled and was put together. And then we track the rover every day as we um, as we move along. And then I also keep track of all the rocks that we do science on. Uh, so when we take a picture of a rock or um, shoot it with like chem cam, a laser to get the chemistry or put the arm down to take a picture of it or drill, um, we wanna know where that is so that over time, we can build up the science story of, you know, here's where we landed, here where the rocks were like, okay, then we went to Yellowknife Bay, where the rocks like there. Now we're at Mont Sharp. How have those rocks changed over time? So I just kind of I kind of do the the geometry to figure out where all those things are um, for various instruments. So here on Earth, we have satellites that allow us to use GPS. And even with GPS, when I call you know, a, a Uber or Lyft or one of these car services, sometimes they want to pick me up halfway down the block. Right. <laughs> they or think I am so. You're on a, a bridge, but it looks like you're actually in the ocean. Right. Right. Yep. So, how do you, I mean, the fact that we have GPS here and it's mm -hmm. inaccurate at times, mm -hmm. uh, how do you manage that on another planet where we don't have satellites? Well, we do have satellites. Do, we have. Do a, we? Do we? Well, we do. Yeah, we have okay. five satellites. Um, uh, Mars Odyssey, which is about oh mm. boy, twenty years old. Um, mm. Mars Crons Orbiter is about uh, ten to fifteen. Um, Maven, um, Mars Express, um, ISRO from India, and I'm probably missing one, but I don't think I am. Um, so about five satellites uh, in orbit, but they don't have GPS. I mean, they you could kind of make a GPS out of it, but it wouldn't be super accurate. So our GPS system has 25-ish satellites that are constantly orbiting in different orbits. And, and at any one time to get your location, you need about, I mean, you need a minimum of three. You really want eight at one time. And so they have all these different constellations. So there's always like eight satellites overhead. Um, on Mars, you're lucky to get one maybe two at the same time. And so you just can't get that same positional accuracy. So we don't do GPS. Um, literally, uh, myself and uh, one other person, uh, Dr. Tim Parker, um, we're uh, localization scientists. 
Um, and so we keep track of whether we, we are the Martian GPS for the rovers. Uh, so basically we have a very high detailed base map of where we're, where the rover is. Um, and it's uh, the pixel size are about 25 centimeters per pixel. It's like the size of a laptop. And then we take images on the ground and we literally just match them up together manually and say, okay, the, you know, this rock is that, that rock in the orbit and this, that's crater is that crater. And so we use that to actually locate the rover on the surface. And we do that every time the rover drives. Um, it's a very manual process. It's, it's kind of an old, like, you know, like pick this here, pick this here, triangulate and get a location. Um, however, we are usually within 25 centimeters, um, 50 centimeters at most of any time the rover drives. So, uh, more accurate than GPS uh, on earth, but you know, a very manual process. Also, we and, don't drive that far. And, and how, but you're saying that you know sometimes better where the rover is than the rover does. So th that's how right. you're figuring it out. Then how is the rover figuring out where it is? Uh, okay. Uh, so the rover inside has a, um, an IMU, an inertial measurement unit. So basically when it moves, it can measure that motion. Um, but it has a certain level of accuracy to that. Um, so it can tell like when it's moving forward or to the side or turning and, and pivoting. Um, and it can go a certain way and get an accuracy of let's say five centimeters. Like let's say you can drive 10 meters, five centimeter accuracy and drive 20 meters. It's, you know, maybe 25 centimeters. It's 40 meters, it's a meter off. And then the farther we go, the more it gets off. So eventually when you're driven kilometers like we have, we've driven almost 20 kilometers, um, you would be off by five kilometers if you didn't have anyone to like scooch it around to the right place. So, um, you know, for short drives, it's not a big deal, but for longer drives, it really becomes an issue. Yeah, so it's so almost like an odometer kind of. Uh, well, yeah, it's, it's a little bit of that. We actually do count, um, the spinning of the wheels, the, the revolutions of the tire uh, of the wheels. And that gives us one measure of distance. Mm -hmm. um, but we tie that with also the direction of where it moved. Mm -hmm. um, and then we also try to look at like um, every it, it'll drive, it'll take a bunch of pictures and then it'll drive again. It'll take pictures again and try to see like, like, oh, I think that rock is that rock. That means we moved 10 centimeters. I thought we moved 15. OK, I'll make a correction. Um, but just eventually over time, it's just not as accurate as manually every once in a while doing the physical match. Um, and, and, you know, and it's actually um, from a, even from a computer vision standpoint, it's really difficult because we're, you know, on the ground, you can see things that are like a centimeter. You know, you can see a little pebble. You know, you could see this uh, you could see this little fossil that existed if only it existed um, on Mars. <laughs> on Mars. Oh, my goodness. Like, you know, we all win awards. Yay. Um, but, you know, when you try to compare that to something like, you know, can you find this on this piece of paper, you know, from orbit? No, you won't. You just you'll never see it. So um, it's just tricky. Um, and so the rover has the same problem of trying to keep itself together and knowing where it is. Have you ever been in a situation like thinking about how the wheels could spin? Have you, have mm -hmm. you ever, ever been in a situation where it's slippery rocks and the wheels kind of spin and yes. so that odometer's going, but no movement is happening? And Yes, yes, yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, not often, um, but occasionally we do cross some bigger sheets of sand or areas of sand. Um, the one I can think of uh, for curiosity was um, Hidden Valley. It was a Big Valley, actually, is it? Uh, it's somewhere on that map there, down towards the bottom. Oops. Yeah, that's okay. Oh uh, yeah, it, you have to have to go up. Uh, let's see. Uh, da, 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 da. Yeah, uh, Moonlight Valley, Hidden Valley. Sorry, I'm pointing at your screen, which you don't see. Um, <laughs> that's okay. Actually, I don't think it's actually it's, it's not labeled there. Um, okay. In any case, it's a. It, it, it was like a, a street sized uh, with valley filled with sand and we're like oh we'll just drive right over it'll be fine and then we got halfway through and then row 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 you know wheels were spinning we're like oh we drove across and we looked we're like oh no we didn't um so it does happen not often because generally we try to drive on ground that's pretty firm and doesn't slip a lot but you know every once in a while stuff happens um but you know we've always backed out and been able to to get out get around it so so we've been good that way but yeah sometimes on a rare occasion we do think we've driven 20 meters we've driven 20 centimeters and then we have like oh ooh, okay let's rethink what happened um but mostly right, so we, you, we you get do you you do you get the images back and you go we're not where we thought we were going to be 
yeah. based on the, we're just this is way way off and we have to figure it all out again yes exactly and so after every time we drive we always take images at the end because we need to know where we are we may think we went 20 meters and when actually we went you know two um critically important it makes a you know changes the whole <laughs> mission uh at that point you know what we're going to do the next day yeah what what kind of things are important so you in in part of your your role, you're finding these uh, these landing locations. So the yep. landing site for the Mars 2020 mission, InSight. What is important for a landing site, and how do you figure out what these spot where these spots are? Um, well, two parts. Um, first part of the science has to be interesting. Um, we've really been doing the uh, uh, follow the water. It's been kind of NASA's mission, so we've looked for places that maybe have been former lakes like Gale Crater, um, where Curiosity is. Um, same thing for Gusev Crater, where the Spirit Rover, uh, the Murr Rover uh, Spirit um, landed, um, or where Opportunity landed, which was, um, they thought was like a, a sandy, shallow sea um, in Rene Planum. Um, Jezero Crater, also a, um, the ship seemed to be like a, a crater filled as, with a lake, and then a, a river delta at the end emptying into the lake. So anywhere where there was water, um, now we're really looking for um, a little bit more than just water, but actually evidence of past life, um, mm -hmm. which is really hard to do. Um, you know, even on Earth, it's hard to find a piece of rock and drill into it and take that out and find this ancient microbe from two billion years ago. Um, you know, and sometimes we get some results and sometimes it's like, I don't know, it kind of looks like that thing. Um, and so they uh, look you at know, you as the keeper of the maps and they say, just, you know, throw a tack at it. Tell us where the life is. We're going to land there. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Um, but, you know, not just one place. There are a bunch of places on Mars, um, 50, 100 um, places that people put time and studies in and look at it from orbit and say, oh, well, I think the water flowed this way and we see these minerals and that means it was this type of, you know, this type of environment. Oh, well, maybe microbes could grow there. Um, so we, um, so that's one part. But the other part is simply we have a, uh, a limit of physical capability, the engineering part. Um, so we have to land below a certain elevation in Mars because Mars atmosphere is incredibly thin. It's six thousandths of Earth's. So, you know, you have to go really deep close to the surface before you get enough um, uh, air essentially um, on Mars to start to use things like parachutes. Uh, in fact, um, it's so thin, it's, so Mars is kind of, um, uh, it, it gives us always a bit of a problem because it has enough air that um, atmosphere that you will burn up if you just try to fly straight in. Um, mm -hmm. However, it doesn't have enough uh, atmosphere to use a parachute to slow you all the way down to you just glide down and then just pop at the bottom. So we use a combination of um, parachutes and rockets um, to slow ourselves down till we can land. Um, so in that case, we have to land below a certain elevation on Mars. So that limits parts of Mars. Other parts of Mars are super dusty. We can't land in really dusty areas, either A, because we will get too much um, dust on solar panels um or it's simply everything's gonna be covered from dust and we won't see anything and we might even be able to drive through it it'll be like um hmm. they call it the foo-foo dust it's so it's so porous <laughs> that you just be like you know like, you're like in a foam pit you know you jump in a foam pit and you're like oh i can't get out it would be something like that um some version <laughs> I love of that the, so, te the technical name foo-foo dust it, the technical name is foo-foo dust yeah. we have lots of technical names like that um <laughs> Uh, and lots of acronyms, um, but uh, yeah. So so those you know those close off essentially whole areas of Mars to landing. So we try you know so we kind of exclude those out and pick the science areas that are outside those areas, and then we design towards um, uh, where those science targets are. And we also try to keep close to the equator, um, so it's warmer. Um, the farther north or south you go, the colder it gets, and then it's just um, uses a lot of energy, and then we can't do as much science. You know we have to like sit there all day to do one science observation if you were way up north. Um, so anyways, those are the kind of things we use to help pick a landing site on Mars. Right. A little bit of science, a little bit of engineering. The combination of the two. Yep. How do you how do you know, looking at pictures from the surface, what the actual I mean, as a geologist, how do you mm -hmm. how do you go about figuring out the characteristics of the surface just based on pictures? Sure. Um, well, Whether it's foo foo dust or well, right or, or not. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, different instruments, different data. So sometimes we just take pictures, just like we do on Earth. Um, 
uh, you know, from orbit, and we can tell the landforms, and we compare those landforms directly to landforms we see on Earth. Um, so Earth analogs kind of tell us things about what ha mm -hmm. what is happening on Mars. Um, you know, we see things that look like lake beds. We see things that look like river streams that are meandering. Um, you know, we see volcanoes, we see glaciers, um, or evidence of glaciers. Um, so we do that directly Earth comparison. Um, the other part is that we, you know, we can look in visible light to look at shape and form and morphology. We can also look at chemistry. So if we see rocks, um, you know, if we see carbonates, that tells us something about how those rocks were formed. Um, if we, we can also look in the kind of the heat version of, uh, of the uh, visible spectrum. So we can look at the heat signature. So if we see um, uh, rocks are really bright during the day, but then they're cold at night, well, that's probably sand. So that tells us something about the material properties. If it's the opposite, it's cold during the day, but warm at night, that means it's probably a solid rock. And so we can use that to kind of tease out what the, how the rocks were made and um, how they're put down and how they form. Um, you know, so we kind of have to piece all these things together. And sometimes we do a lot of math. We do say like, well, what if you had a volcano that had a lot of silica for the lava and you combined it with uh, a lot of nickel and um, not a lot of nickel, but uh, something else. And then you put them together um, you know, what would be the result and what would the landform look like? And so we can do those comparisons as well. Um, it's really tricky. It's, it's, it's a lot of detective work, yeah. um, more so. And, and sometimes there are things on Mars that are simply different and we don't know. And it takes a lot of poking at problems. And, you know, um, I think there's quite a few people who, who will admit that, um, you know, 10 years ago or even five years ago, this is what my PhD was on. By the way, it was completely wrong. Um, Oh, but wow. that's but that's okay. You know, that is science and especially planetary science, you know, where yeah. you we kind of go out on the limb a lot of times and and that's okay. You know, we we have to push it a lot of uh directions to finally narrow down to where we think it's actually happening. That's fascinating. Yeah, I'm just I'm what is, what have been some of the the most surprising findings that you've been a part of? Oh boy. Um I think the most surprising one is um uh, in Gale Crater, where Curiosity River is, um, uh, you know, we expected there to be evidence of water um, and some geology that had water, but the more we look like, we see everything, like water was everywhere in Gale Crater, which may be a surprise, but the more we look at Mars, the more we see that water was all over the planet. Um, you know, we think of Mars right now, it's, you know, it's cold, it's rusty, it's dry, there's no atmosphere, yeah. almost no atmosphere very inhospitable and we used to have like yeah. these little pinpricks of ideas that there was water on the surface and now it's basically like it was just everywhere and now you know we we don't argue where the water was we worry about maybe you know was it ice or how long did it last you know did it last two billion years you know do, did water come out yesterday on the surface or was the last time we saw water was two billion years ago or three billion years ago so we we're kind of like arguing some of that minutiae but you know water was everywhere and it a gale that was certainly so um and then i mean the the big That's discovery cool. is like we went to you know we wanted to find evidence of a lake and see mm -hmm. if it was habitable and that's what we found you know we drilled in yellow knife bay um the rocks even when they even when we drilled the rocks um they turned into a powder and that powder was green now or greenish or grayish um all the other rocks we had we had drilled or or, or um scraped um on mars um were red and so one of the geologic test for any rock is to do a streak test, which is literally just taking a rock and rubbing it like on a piece of um, uh, blah, 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 um, porcelain um, that and it just scrapes the rock and you get a powder and that powder tells you about the rocks. So if the powder's red um, generically for Mars, they're saying it's very oxidized, which means it's not a very habitable environment. Your, your, um, your rocks, basically the water that put those rocks down are going to, are like acids, they're going to eat up life. Um, so these rocks were streaking kind of green grayish, which that told us there was a, a reducing environment, which means there was less oxygen, which means it was more like water from a lake on earth. Um, and then we measured the, the mineral elements inside the rocks that we drilled and they were filled with all these cool nutrients that early life would have loved. So you hmm. could have taken like, you know, some earth microbes at you know, way back, you know, three, 4 billion years ago on Mars, found a lake, threw them in, they probably would have been happy. So that was like, that was, it was exactly what we wanted to find and it's what we did. And that, you know, and we did it within 300 earth days. 
Um, well, you know, so it was just like, yeah. it, it, you couldn't have asked for anything better. We, we did it like almost immediately, you know, um, you know, Mars, uh, uh likes to eat spacecraft. Um, <laughs> we've been very <laughs> successful, um, with the U S missions as of, you know, 1990s on, um, but you know, any day, um, could be the last day of, of the mission. So, um, to get a science return, to get the primary science return. Um, is so important and we really found it and we, you know, our predictions were right and, and, and that was pretty awesome. And now it's, now everything, and not everything is gravy. I mean, we still, we hadn't gotten to the mountain yet, um, Mount right. Sharp. It's five kilometers tall. It's a big stack of rocks that we think tells the history of Mars. And we're literally driving from the bottom to the top. And in geology, that's the oldest rocks, basically up to the youngest rocks. And that's what's really um, exciting about Gale Crater, why we went there because we can maybe look at Mars history in this one section. Um, so every day, you know, every day we can go higher up Mount Sharp, um, see new rocks. We're just learning something more about the whole planet. Um, so super exciting. Um, how, but yeah, but how yeah. Far up, how far up have you gone so far? Uh, we are about, well, for the whole height of the mountain, we're maybe 20-ish percent. Okay. Something like that, thirty percent. We're about um, two hundred meters above the landing site, um, so we're we're kind of still at the bottom, um, but we're getting there. We're we're making our way up, and uh, like from orbit, we're, our whole point was to go to the mountain, um, but we couldn't land on the mountain. It was just too rough, so we landed right. uh, like ten kilometers away, and so we've been spending all these years just trying to get to that point, um, even though we found really cool stuff at where we landed, which was the best. Um, but, you know, we really wanted to go to the mountain. So we're taking our, you know, we're trying to work our way up. And uh, yeah, so it's pretty exciting. So yeah, so we're like 20% of the way. Um, we will only get up about, um, I'm going to throw out a number, 40% of the way, um, simply because the, the top is too rough. However, the, the top of the mountain is mostly all the same material as far as we can tell. So we're excited to, if we can get to that point where we go from what we think is wet Mars, the bottom of the mountain, to the mm -hmm. interface where we get to dry Mars, I mean done did it um perfect you know um yeah but, how much you know, longer i mean you're only you've been there several years and yeah. are 20 percent. i mean do you think there's any possibility i mean the engineering of curiosity is amazing yeah yeah well you, but, you know it, yeah. yeah well we have to trade um science today science tomorrow <laughs> which one do you want you know right. so you can stay here and do all this great science but it's in this small area. Um, mm -hmm. Or you can do a little science and then do a little science and a little science and do a little science up here and get this bigger picture. So we have to balance that. Um, yeah, engineering wise, the rover is doing awesome. Um, you know, had some issues. We had some issues with the drill. We had some issues with the wheels. Um, you know, we solved those problems. That's what JPL does. Um, yep. So we've been doing, we've still got all the instruments basically working um, uh, at 100%. Um, some are a little degraded, but not so much that we're not going to get some amazing science. So, yeah, you know, uh, I think we can do it. Um, we just have to, you know, keep our, uh, I don't know, mast in the right direction, something like that. The camera's pointed <laughs> in the right air direction, something like that. Um, yeah, but that's, that's a goal. Everyone wants to go higher. Um, it's just a matter of, you know, science today, science tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, it. You have to really figure out where what you want and what's more important to your goals. And absolutely, yeah, yeah. really figuring that out. For as far as what's going on right now, we've got uh, Insight that has also mm -hmm. had some issues. It landed. It landed great. Ended up pretty much yes. right where you wanted to be. Mm -hmm. Is it still doing well? What are you? What's your role with Insight since it's landed? Uh, my role was very early in the mission. Uh, mm -hmm since I was keeper of the maps, I was yeah. the keeper of the map because <laughs> the landers have moved. Um, the idea was that we wanted to know um, in front of the landing, uh, in front of the, um, the lander, um, where can we put down the seismometer size and the heat probe HP3 um, in this area, just in front of the rover, like, like the size of your desk. Um, where can we put those instruments where they will get the most science and where they can um, operate for, you know, forever? until the, um, they stop, decide to stop working. Um, so I helped map out that landing area and then um, developed a, a web-based tool to um, help scientists look at the different areas and engineers and decide where those instruments went. 
Um, so once that was done, um, so they found a good place to put the seismometer, a nice quiet place, and went to put the heat probe. And then, you know, my job was done, and I walked away, um, per se. Um, yeah, so they're, they're doing really well. So the seismometer um, size is doing great. Um, we're seeing all sorts of weird earthquakes and, or sorry, Mars quakes. Mars um, quakes, yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> coming from Mars, there's a bunch of papers that just came out in science and talk about how, you know, we have these mysterious rumblings we don't understand. We have other things which we think are active um, faulting, active earth, uh, Mars quakes. I, I can't stop myself. Um, Mars quakes happening. There's also things where what we're really looking for is something, some big event that will happen um, somewhere near us so it'll it'll send a seismic wave all the way down to the core and come back so we can see what the interior is like. Haven't had one yet, but um, we're waiting for that. Um, but yeah, it's it's returning all sorts of great information about the um, the formation of the crust, how thick it is, and um, just how active Mars is right now. You know, we 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 didn't we can only make an assumption like we didn't know like you know the you know um, we always think about on Earth like earthquakes like oh there's horrible things, but they also tell us about what's moving and what's not um, on the surface. It's that, you know, for Earth, obviously, you know, for humans, it helps us decide, you know, where can we live and <laughs> where can we be safe? But um, on Mars, it's about like, what's the, how thick is the crust? How, how big is the core? Does it even have a core? That was the thing that blew my mind on that, you know, Earth has a metallic core. Mars, we don't know. It could have a completely molten core, nothing solid. It's just a big ball of hot, goo um it's weird right i, I would know. never have thought yeah. that that was a or there's a core but it's solid and it's not moving and it's frozen all the way out to the surface frozen in a, in a, in a rough sense you know um we don't know but that's why the seismometer is there um hp3 um yeah had a bit of a rough time um you know we've only um drilled about uh that far down into the subsurface um with a literal drill with curiosity so we have ideas of what the subsurface is like, but we don't really know. Um, so we're like, oh, this area looks like it has two or three meters that we can get down to the surface, put the heat probe, we can pound down and life will be good. And then it went down about that much and it stopped. Um, so Mars is tricky. <laughs> um, but right now, so we, we literally have, um, let's see, props. Um, if this is the heat probe, we've actually put the tip of the arm uh, with its scoop on the end. And so we're kind of pushing it down and letting it hammer. And as it hammers down, we kind of push a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more to get it as deep into the soil as we can. Um, Cause we really want to measure the heat coming from the center of the planet. And cause that tells us about how active it is, but we can't do that until we're down pretty far. Uh, well, not, well, pretty far now. It, actually it's not that far. It's only about a meter or two and we can start to feel heat from the planet. But um, we're not going to get that deep, uh, we don't think, but we're going to keep trying. Um, so it just, may just take us a little bit longer, but we'll see, you know? Yeah. Uh, how, first, how, it's so fascinating. First time we ever you, tried. Yeah, digging on digging on Mars, the surface where you landed, there's there's a rough, there's a, a hard patch. And the question yeah. now, I would imagine, is, is it like that everywhere? Is it just this area? Is it, is, is it, is it dappled? <laughs> right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, and just, uh, you know, we're in an area that uh, was originally a, a very old lava field. And so we see on the surface there are lots of rocks everywhere. Um, so it does, in, but in the area, we're kind of in this little depression um, that we think has a lot of soil, but it could be soil mixed with a lot of big rocks. And so if yeah. there's just a big rock below the surface, you'll never see it. The surface looks smooth as glass. And then you go, dink. And that's what we're kind of worried about. But we don't know yet. There's lots of things with the probe and how it hammers and, uh, you know, and, and how it touches the soil. And does it touch the soil enough to actually push down versus push up when the, when the little hammer, like, cause the hammer goes down and then back up. So it has a little recoil. And so if it's not touching the soil, it actually will bounce out. And it did that a few times. Cause we were like, Oh, it's going down. Awesome. And then it went ding, 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 ding. Like, no, 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 no. <laughs> Came all Go the down. way back up. <laughs> ding, try it again. Ding, 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 ding. And so, you know, we're just like, why are you doing that? That's ridiculous. Um, but just physics, we've never done it before. So, you know, just keep trying new things. Yeah. I, that's got to be the most fun is, is the unknown nature and the exploration mm -hmm. and the, you know, the on the spot troubleshooting as well because mm -hmm. of because of all the, the unknowns. Mm -hmm. 
Absolutely. Um, you know, I mean, I'm more of a scientist than engineer, yeah. at least in terms of um, uh, my day to day. Uh, but the engineers, yeah, I mean, they, they love this stuff. And they they love to figure things out and they, they do it really, really, really well. Um, so, yeah, I mean, but it's also, you know, frustrating, of course, you know, you imagine there's some science and be like, he broke, just go down. I want to get my science. Um, but, you know, we do the best we can. Yeah, there's that animation there where we're uh, putting the the scoop on the tip of the tip of the probe just to give it a little bit of pressure to sink down. Um, yeah, and so that's uh, uh, Perseverance, our soon to be launching rover in July. That's right. It was named Perseverance. That's the yes. name of the Mars 2020, 2020 mission. Mm -hmm. yes. Yep. And uh, yeah, are so you, we're all pretty excited. Yeah. Are you excited about the landing location? Can you tell us about the the landing spot for Perseverance? Sure. Um, so Perseverance is going to Jezero Crater, uh, which is uh, slightly north of the equator. Um, and it is a... a 45-ish kilometer diameter crater. Um, it used to have an ancient lake, so we can see a stream that went into the crater and then went out the other side. Um, and at the entrance point, there's a huge river delta, um, which we're very excited about. So what we're hoping is that um, either the lake had some kind of organisms or um, organism floated down the stream and were deposited in the lake. Um, so, so it has a lot of clays in it, um, a lot of also a lot of carbonates, which we don't see in a lot of places on Mars. Um, so we're hoping that you know, wherever, wherever that's there is organic related or at least may preserve the organics. Um, so those are things we're kind of looking for. So we're gonna land in this ancient, another ancient lake, look at this ancient riverbed, see if any um, ancient organisms were preserved inside that river delta or maybe within the carbonates themselves. Um, that's our goal. And so then we're also gonna, once we go there, and then just a, a general background is like this area is kind of used to be very volcanic. So there's a lot of heat and we have heat and you have a lot of water. So the water was liquid. And so those combinations of heat, you know, warmth to kind of keep you moving or doing something. And then the water really is a, a great combination of terms of um, microbial life. Um, you know, right. it, it could be, you, know, you could have water, but it may be frozen too cold and then you just can't do stuff. Right. You, you know, you go up to uh, the Arctic and what do you want to do? You want to sit in your cabin all day. Um, <laughs> Microbes, <laughs> you know, on a big puffy coat, right? Big, by, yeah, yeah, Drink yeah hot by chocolate. fire. There yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, no hot chocolate on Mars. It's very sad. Um, yeah. So, uh, but the heat is good. Is a good thing. So we're really excited. That's a place where we have kind of these two elements. Uh, but yeah, so the rover is going to go there and collect samples of all these places we think we um, have organic life. Um, or in the cases of some of the instruments like Sherlock and Pixel, they can actually, or even SuperCam, um, they can actually look at a rock and see if there's organics in the rock which is a totally oh, wow. new capability in terms of like visually seeing them. Um, and then we'll take certain samples, we'll put them in little tubes, um, we'll drop them in a certain place on a surface, and then a whole other mission called Mars Sample Return will come collect them, put them in a rocket, put them to orbit, and another spacecraft's going to swing by, grab them, send it back to Earth, and then drop it at, drop it home. I didn't... What? I... <laughs> 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 I did not think we were ready to... Get oh, yeah. samples back. Oh, we're we're so ready. Um, yeah, we uh, perseverance will literally drill samples. We'll collect it. You know, a piece of rock about like this. Stick it in a tube, seal it, and it's gonna leave it somewhere on the ground. Then yeah, then let's say your mission has to land there. It's probably gonna be another. Well, the plan is to have another. Um, we call a fetch rover. It will literally just drive from the spacecraft. Go get the samples bring them back and then stick them in a rocket that a rocket gopher. has yeah it is a gopher that rocket takes off again goes into orbit another spacecraft has to swing from earth grab that come back home and another spacecraft is going to, is going to detach and then land somewhere and we collect the samples wow. um super complicated but no we're we are all in uh very you know, complicated the, but yeah uh you know the, the most complicated part of this rover is that whole sample handling system it literally like it takes it drills a core it sticks it inside the rover does all these things there's actually there is an, a little mini arm inside the rover and all in the belly and all it does is like it grabs a sample and turns it around and takes a picture and seals it and then when it's ready it'll take it and then drop it on the surface um it's super complicated and everything has to be super clean and you know 
Mm -hmm. It's in the side of the rover. We can't go, you know, put a wrench on it later. It has to work all the time, 100%. Um, so, yeah. And that's oh, just that's, that's just that's just getting the rock. <laughs> and then we have it to make really sure we just sounds like the rover is like eating it, digesting it and like pooping out the sample ready to go. <laughs> like. Um that's pretty much it. Yeah. Yeah, it's it, it that 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 um that analogy has not gone unnoticed or unmentioned um okay, in our daily good. exercise. Yes. Just me. Yeah. Okay, uh, good. I didn't want to break it out, but yes, we're going to poop out rock samples. Leave it to long. our zoologist. Um, yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Fascinating. <laughs> it is. A, it Even is a it, robot poop. <laughs> and 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 the great part is we want to go collect it and bring it home. Yay. I don't know. That's what we <laughs> biologists so happy. Look at all the poop I collected. It's awesome. And um, hopefully amazing. there won't be any microbes inside of the robot that then gets in the sample. Well, well, that's exactly it. That's right. Um, yeah. yeah. So we do all these. Um, very intense cleaning exercises, and we have a certain minimum amount of microbe or organic, not really microbe, but really organic material of any type that we're allowed in the system. So, uh, yeah, no, it's going to be super scrubbed um, and then some. So, yeah. Yes, that'll we'll bring, be, yeah. That'll be amazing. Are you responsible or are you part of the team that's responsible for? marking where each of these little poops ends up um <laughs> as they're yes. dropped when you put it like that way um no, uh actually yes i will mark all the rover poops um yeah no i will um in fact they will be um probably some of the best documented locations on mars um we have to um you know we need to know exactly where it is because the other rover has to come and find it Mm -hmm. um so yeah no we will know down to the millimeter exactly where all those tubes are um yeah so yeah yeah part of my job my uh uh my job on the mission is kind of like i do on msl i'm, I'm i'll be a mapping specialist one of two yeah. uh, myself and uh dr nathan williams um we will help keep track of where the rover is um the areas where we want to do science um where all the science happened um, and a lot of these, um, all the information, what, what pictures we took of the samples and where they are, we'll go into like a, we call it a dossier, um, which mm -hmm. will go back to scientists so that we can, when we get the samples back, here's what we learned from Mars, um, from the instruments now go throw your instruments at them and, you know, um, do all the awesome science you can do that you do on earth that you can't do on Mars. So, yeah. That so. is so cool. That's just a, I, I think. This all the way it all works together is just fascinating. All the details that need to be figured out. Mm -hmm. um, right now, as we're in the middle of this COVID nineteen crisis, the growing mm -hmm. crisis, and more and more people are staying home. Now, I, these are robots that are on the surface of Mars. Yep. Who who's watching the robots? <laughs> well, everybody's at home. <laughs> well. Um... Didn't plan it to be this way, um, but uh, so um, when the mission first lands, we kind of bring everyone together um, to kind of work out the very early days of the mission so we can kind of talk mm -hmm. easily with each other. Um, but after 90 days, we actually all go back to our own um, universities. So um, in general, the, the, the Mars missions or any, any planetary missions really works from remote operations. So we do have a bunch of engineers who kind of work together at JPL. Um, but you know it's all on computers mm -hmm. um we do a lot of meetings um but it's certainly the case that we have you know we have webex <laughs> or zoom you know we dial mm -hmm. into meetings all the time we're actually um used to working remotely um you know sometimes even like <laughs> okay i'm gonna admit a little thing um you know, sometimes in a meeting you don't really want to go to, like, you know, like, it's going to be an hour meeting. They need me for five minutes. I'm just going to dial in from my office. So doing remote operations is actually pretty natural for a lot of the mission operations people. There are only um, a few details that we're trying to work out this week in terms of um, um, people who need, like, you know, a certain machine and can they log on to it? And is there enough internet connection to do this yeah. complicated task? Um, but otherwise, we're kind of, you know, we were kind of set up. Um, I didn't. It didn't take much, I mean, for me personally, um, to transition to working remotely. In fact, a lot of times I will, um, cause I live, um, uh, so, you know, JPL is in Pasadena, California. I'm in Huntington Beach, California, which if anyone knows is a good 40 miles away and not fun in the middle of rush hour traffic. No. So sometimes, you know, if I, if, if the 
operations is really early, I will work from home or stop somewhere, uh, get a coffee, do some work at, you know, you know wait for rush hour to finish, wait for rush hour to finish <laughs> and then go yeah. in. So remote operations is um, kind of built into our, um, our, our DNA in terms of uh, how we run things. So it, it, in that sense, we're, we're, in that sense, we're, we're very lucky um, that yeah, we were kind of prepared absolutely. for it. Um, there still are, um, and the robots uh, are used to working remotely. The yeah. robots are always used to working remotely. Yeah, like they're like <laughs> whatever. It's just another day. Um, yeah, but we do. Um, yeah, so we're, so we're, we're still it takes a little bit of transition because there are people who need sometimes need to be there. But you know, like everything, social distancing. If you can instead of having forty people in the room, you can have two. You know, you've solved a lot of problems there. So yeah, we're making do. You know, but then. But, you know, that's just mission operations, you know, which is like 20 percent or 30 percent of JPL. The rest is people, you know, who have labs and things like that. And so, you know, there's, uh, you know, trickiness that way. Um, you know, you can't can't put 10 people in a in a small room, um, you know, doing the, the things that they do. Um, so, yeah. By the way, as for mission operations, we're we're actually we were very easy to trans over. It didn't take more than a week. And we were like, OK, we're good. I think we got this figured out. Yeah, we're good. Yeah, that's so nice. Keep them going. In terms of landing sites and places that we have plans to go and places that you're looking at, and obviously you know Mars very well, maybe as well as the back of your own hand. But could you have, uh, could you have, if you could choose a place that you would go to land on Mars, where would you go? Uh, you mean like sending a human, or, or just you, that you or, or, or just in general? Robot, just, just in oh, okay. general. Anywhere? Uh, oh. Is there is there a spot that if you had the choice, you would okay? Oh, I see. Oh, where where would I send the next mission? Yeah. Um. Wow, that's a tough one. Um. I I mean, uh, Valles Marineris is probably uh, it's pretty exciting. It's the largest uh, valley in the solar system. Uh, it's as long as the United States is wide, um, certainly uh, much deeper than our Grand Canyon. Um, so lots of history there. Um, boy, I, I, you know, I like all of Mars. It's kind of hard. Um, but I also, <laughs> I mean, the other thing is like, um, you know, uh, there, I, I mean, like uh, if we were talking about humans, I mean, like I would send them to Gale Crater. I think it's very exciting or um, uh, for, for a bunch of reasons. Um, but you know, I'm a little bit biased, uh, cause yeah. I work on that mission a lot. And that was kind of my, 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 uh, big mission to, to join. Um, yeah, but I think like, uh, so going to some of the volcanoes, get some of the, like, we don't, we don't go to really like almost every rock on Mars is, um, basaltic or volcanic to some way, shape or form chemically wise. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, but actually visiting a volcano would be pretty exciting. A lava flow um you know doing some measurements there um uh going to the polar caps would be a pretty exciting drilling in some ice or, you know looking at the ice layers and seeing what's in the yeah. what's you know what what is in the ice column um especially deep into it i think would be exciting as well um but yeah or, or almost anywhere right it, hard <laughs> hard to pick sometimes um some more exciting than others but it's like it's, it's all good um yeah i mean i would love us to go back to abusive crater which was like um, very interesting and like these weird digitate features, which maybe are like hot springs. Like, well, are they, you know, I'm going to go there and crack one of those off and take a look at it up close. So stuff like that. Yeah. yeah. So now I'm wondering, okay. <laughs> if you physically could go to Mars. Yes. Would you? Yes. In a I second. Wanna, I want, yes. I want to come home though. Um, that's really, no, not that's one way no yeah, way yeah, yeah. with our you know no warp drive or anything like yeah, that yeah, right? yeah, 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 yeah. Like our normal, current science right if Six, you could go to mars would you yeah. go i would go I, I would go yeah um there are a lot of people who would and i don't blame them um i would go i would probably um uh cry and or pass out the whole way up and <laughs> <laughs> and the whole way down um but you know it's fine. Um, I'll, I'll deal. Um, no, I would love to go. Um, I do. I definitely want to come home. But yeah, the question is just would I go? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It just would be too exciting. I mean, you know, people say like, oh, you're gonna be bored six months waiting to get there and six months come back. I'm like, yeah, but I'm going to Mars, man. <laughs> like, I'm gonna be in the sort of, I can touch all those rocks I want to touch every day when I look at the monitor. Um, you know, it, I just, 
I would do it um, for better or for worse. I don't know if I would want to go. It seems. Yeah. yeah. Well, and Justin know, in, in the chat explorer. room in YouTube is asking, and who would you need to convince to let you go? <laughs> 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 That's really uh, that is well, a good point. <laughs> first, NASA. If right. I get past NASA, right. Right. <laughs> then the higher order, you know, uh, my family, of course. Um, yeah. uh, oddly, it, it, I know this is weird, but because she's a scientist also, not a Mars scientist, but environmental science. So when we go out, you know, like I'm talking about the rocks, she's talking about the plants. It's a perfect match. Um, but uh, we, we, she's like, oh yeah, I'd let you go. I mean, I know you'd want to go. So we, 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 we have an agreement. You know, I, I have the the Mars pass. I don't know. Um, to yeah, go to Mars. definitely, yeah. <laughs> I was given the opportunity. Um, go to Mars free. You know, it's, yeah. it's very important to uh, have that discussion at some point. Never gonna happen, but nevertheless, um, yeah, no, I think we we'll be okay. But I mean, you know, I have I have two boys, so that would be a little tough. But you know, yeah. depending on the day, they might be like, "Yeah, go to Mars, Dad, come on." <laughs> depending on the day, you might be around. like, "Yeah, see you later." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right, right. With later, all this but, um... this uh, homeschooling situation happening, <laughs> I'm out. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I'm done. <laughs> you want some social distancing? Go to Mars. Never come back. Uh, no. Absolutely. <laughs> Yeah. Oh. This has been just wonderful. Thank you so much for joining us and talking uh, talking to us about Mars and mapping and all of the stuff that you're you've been working on and will be working on. This is it's your excitement is palpable. Oh. Well, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. It was a great time. And thanks for, you know, bringing the dinosaur. Always. Always. We all need a little bit of levity. That's Where right. can people find you online if they would like to follow you and your mapping adventures? Uh, sure. Uh, I am on Twitter at Circular, C-I-R-Q-U-E-L-A-R. Um, it is my personal account. It's not an NASA account. So um, beware. You know, it's it's half Mars and mapping and half um, probably shouting but um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. But you feel free to follow me, and uh, you know, I uh, I certainly uh, bring the science when I can. Fantastic! Thank you so much. Have a wonderful night. Thanks. We are gonna move along with the rest of our show. Thanks so much for joining us. Yep. Take care. You too. Thank you. Everyone, this was Dr. Fred Califf, and we are going to move on with our show. We've got some science in the second half. Stay tuned for a little bit more This Week in Science. Thank you for listening to Twist. You are the reason that we are able to do what we do every single week, bringing you up-to-date and down-to-earth views on science and sometimes out-to-Mars views on science discoveries. And with your help, we can do even more together. That's right. We can bring a sane perspective to a world full of misinformation. Head to twist.org right now. Click on the Patreon link and choose your level of support. Be a part of bringing sanity and science to more people. Also, I would like to, I think that's what I needed to do. That's what I needed to say. You can you can share twists with people. That's what we want to do. We can't do this without you, really. We need you. We need you. We can explain Things you've heard with more than intuition A line of reason shows the way to go A new conclusion The methods are hypothesis and patience are And we're back. You're listening to This Week in Science. Yes, you are. We're back. And Dr. Califf, you're still here. Do you want to talk science oh. with us or are you just going to listen? Uh, I was just going to listen. Um, okay. But you know, whatever. Okay, if something if something is interesting to you, feel free to okay. pipe in. <laughs> We're gonna is this keep on? moving. Okay. Is, is this thing on? That's right. Always assume a hot mic. <laughs> <laughs>
All right, jumping back into the science, we are going to talk, yes, about COVID-19 because that is at the top of everyone's minds right now. And there is some very interesting uh, science around this disease, this virus that we are dealing with at the moment. So first, last week we had a quick convert. We had a conversation and Blair, you asked about how safe your mail was. Mm hmm to handle. And just about that same day, I think it was that same day, a preprint came out that has now been published in the New England Journal of Medicine on aerosol and surface stability of SARS-CoV-2 as compared with SARS-CoV-1. Now, SARS-CoV-2 is the virus that causes COVID-19, the disease we're dealing with right now. SARS-CoV-1 was the virus behind the SARS epidemic. Mm -hmm. Now... In their findings, they discovered that SARS-CoV-2, the COVID-19 virus, is uh, viable in aerosols for up to three hours. But that was the duration of their experiment, so they don't know if it's longer. So three hours. There mm-hmm. is a reduction in the infectious particles in uh, during that time. So that it does reduce, but it's still viable in the air. For three hours. Now, surfaces. Where is it Where is it viable? A lot more viable on plastic and the stainless steel. So they looked at plastic, stainless steel, copper, and cardboard. Plastic and stainless steel, they found that it was viable for up to 72 hours on plastic, 48 hours on stainless steel. This is why we want to wipe down surfaces. Mm-hmm. Copper... It was only viable for four hours. So copper has antiviral uh, properties that break it down and keep it from being keep it from being viable for very long. Cardboard, which you could associate also with, you know, Amazon packages or your mail. Paper, yeah. Paper. Mm-hmm. It was viable for 24 hours. So they measured a, a viable SARS-CoV-2 for 24 hours after. So if you really want to feel safe when you're getting your mail, mm-hmm. maybe, you know, let it sit for a day. And, yeah. I mean, or, I, or spray it with Lysol. I don't I know. I guess it depends <laughs> what you're trying to protect yourself from, right? Because if you're worried mm-hmm. about, you know, people were saying they were worried about packages from China, right? Which mm-hmm. at this point, first of all, it's everywhere. That's <laughs> so it's, it's, it's everywhere. that's it all matter. silly. But it, it takes more than 24 hours to stuff for stuff to get here from China. So that's yeah. not so much a concern. Um, even most mail, I would say it takes more than 24 usually hours. more than 24 hours to get yeah. to you. So really the only person then you have to worry about is your mail carrier, um, yep. which, you know, I've been seeing people being very careful. So hopefully that's, you know, that's not too much of a concern, but uh, yeah. yes, if you're very worried about it, Leave it, leave it just overnight. Let it, but just let it sit overnight. There you go. But it, this is different from what I heard a couple of weeks ago. Yes, but now we actually have a study mm-hmm. that has looked at this, and now we have some information to inform our actions. Which that's why I like science. It tells us things. So now I'm going to demand all of my mail be delivered in copper envelopes. <laughs> <laughs> Right. You more put it in to ship, but put it in the <laughs> copper container, please. Yeah. You That's really right. want to send me that spam? Go ahead and put it in a copper envelope. <laughs> ma- all those mailers. It's going to yeah. get really expensive really fast. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then let me dive into. I'm going to jump into this story now about our new reality that we're kind of looking at. Uh, mm-hmm. We are staring down the barrel of, of a very se- uh, serious, potentially societally changing epidemic that uh, an analysis came out of a team from the Imperial College London on SARS, on on COVID-19 and how it will potentially spread if we enforce certain ways of dealing with it, whether uh, we use what they called mitigation strategies, which is just very light social distancing, telling people who are 70 and older and have health issues that make them more likely to get the disease, telling them to socially isolate, and then specifically picking people who have the disease or who have tested for it and getting them to isolate or be quarantined. Uh, Mitigation is less 
impactful on society as a whole. Their other option was suppression, which in is basically what China has undergone in uh, taking its society and putting it and Italy as well, putting their society under lockdown and massive social distancing practices to keep people apart, um, reducing the sizes of gatherings. Uh, this model, the 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 end of the story is that the thing that worked in their computer modeling of the disease was suppression. Even with mitigation that would work partially, we would still overshoot our healthcare infrastructure's capacity, especially in the ICU and for ventilator machines, which, and we would end up, even with mitigation, having um, at least a million deaths in the United States. And so then the suppression, everything's great. You suppress and then the disease goes away. It doesn't spread. It seems really nice. But the problem is if you ever stop suppressing, the population still is not immune to it. So the disease comes back again. And so they say that we have to suppress. This model suggests we have to do suppression tactics for 18 months, or which is the first estimate of when a vaccine will be available. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That is so long. Yes, that is so long. But I was I follow some amazing people on Twitter and was reading the feed of an individual named Trevor Bedford, who is a researcher up in Washington. And he has been on the front lines of looking at the genetics of the of this virus since the beginning, uh, since the outbreak in Seattle. And he has some thoughts about this uh this paper that's out of the Imperial College, this uh, the modeling that they've done, they don't. They only look at a few possibilities: mitigation or suppression, and a little bit of a little bit of variation within those two possibilities. But what he says is that if we really buckle down in terms of technology, we may have a chance at not having to suppress as heavily. That. If we do something that is more like South Korea's response in just testing everybody and tracking mm -hmm. down the cases, making sure that everybody who has it or is connected to somebody who's had it self-isolates or self-quarantines, then that can, we can stop and lead to suppression in a, a quicker and easier way. Uh, but testing, he says, is the main uh, the main strategy. And so he just says we just need to put all of our his one of his tweets here says the first strategy revolves around a massive rollout of testing capacity. We believe that a significant proportion of epidemic transmission is due to mild and maybe asymptomatic inf infections and that a lot of transmission may occur in the window before symptoms develop. These routes can be reduced by a huge rollout of testing capacity. If someone can be tested early in their illness before they show symptoms, they could effectively self-isolate and reduce onward transmission compared to isolation when system symptoms develop. Then he goes on to say the second strategy that he that he has been reading about is related to cell phone location data, which people may have issues with related to privacy, but According to some con some researchers who have been considering this option, uh, through cell phone location data, we would be able to combine that data with data on known positive cases to alert possible expo exposures to self-isolate and get tested. Mm. So there's also um, another strategy of getting serological assays run on people to identify individuals who have recovered and are likely to possess mm. immunity. And mm -hmm. those people could uh, return to the workforce and keep society functioning. Mm -hmm. So if we tested those people, which we haven't started doing yet. His last, his last tweet, though, I think is the most important. Together, I believe these and other case-based strategies can bring down the epidemic. This is the Apollo program of our times. Let's get to it. Yeah, I mean, the important thing about that is that what all the scientists working in all the different ways to try to tackle this problem need is one thing, and that's time. Yep. And that is why I'm working from home right now. That is why everyone is working from home right now, because we are trying to give them time. And I'm, it's hard, but I'm happy. I'm happy to do it. Yeah. 
And I, I always think it's, um, you know, may or you know, maybe I'm maybe I'm healthy. Maybe I got a mild case, but maybe my next door neighbor can't have that. And yeah. the next person, and the next person, you're like, you just don't know. You don't know who can, who can ride it out, and who can't. And what you know. And I, I think for for me personally, I'm like, I'll I'll bite the bullet. Let's do it. You know. I mean, the I I, re I read that study or parts of the results of that study, and mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, that's the hill we have to climb. Yeah. Start climbing. You know, it's it's not going to get better. You you can you can sit at the bottom of the hill as long as you want, but if you don't start climbing it, you'll never get to the top. So, just like uh, yeah. curiosity, just like yeah. curiosity. That's right. It all comes around. Um, and I also have to say, I you know, I'm at the end of my second day of working from home, and I can't believe how hard I'm finding it already because I am such an extrovert. I'm used to like popping over to my coworker's desk mm -hmm. and bouncing an idea off of that. And it's just, it's been such a change for me, an intense change. But I also have been spending all day on Zoom meetings and social mm -hmm. media mm -hmm. and email and listening to podcasts. And mm -hmm. all, there's all of this amazing technology that we have to stay connected. I cannot imagine what this would be like without the amazing connectivity that we have. Mm -hmm. And so I'm I'm trying really hard to focus on that and recognize that, you know, Netflix added functionality for us to be able to watch movies together <laughs> and pause and chat while we're watching movies. And I think I I have hope because I do feel like our society is is rising to the occasion. I see social media being used for the right thing, to applaud people for staying home, to support each other, to deliver groceries to people who are over 65. I we got to we got to make it work and the way to do it is to stay hopeful and reach out and reach out to people who you know are having a hard time. Hello. <laughs> so um I, yeah, and, we're, we're and I apologize for not reaching out more because I've been training for this isolation my entire life. <laughs> I work in my basement. <laughs> yeah. Ooh. I've been training for this. I, I mean, I'm happy to go in the browser and look at rocks of Mars. I can't touch them anyways. Exactly. There's no difference true. to me. <laughs> I'm You're on Mars every day. That tactile um, item already. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, one more story on the COVID front that is actually exciting news. There is an NIH trial along with a company called Moderna, who they are trying the first human clinical trial of a COVID-19 vaccine at the Kaiser Permanente Washington Health Research Institute in Seattle. The first dose was given this last weekend. They are going to be testing not the efficacy, but just the safety and the re the response to of the body to this new vaccine in 45 young healthy volunteers who will receive different doses of the vaccine. Now, this vaccine, the reason they've got something so quickly and other other groups are working on similar things uh, is that it's a an interesting type of vaccine called an mRNA vaccine. mRNA is messenger RNA and in our cells, messenger RNA is little bits of, of RNA that goes from the DNA out to the ribosomes to get translated into proteins. And the idea behind the mRNA vaccine is that we can plug the, a little bit of viral mRNA that is the antigen that we want our cells to recognize and to get a immune response against. And then our own cells take that mRNA and start treating it almost like a virus itself, taking that mRNA and making copies of it, it's turning out more copies, making little, pro little viral proteins that then the body recognizes and says that's not okay and mounts an immune response. So it's a really interesting idea that it doesn't, it, it just uses the machinery that viruses use to copy themselves already. The interesting, or I guess uh, the, the questionable part about this is that this particular type of mRNA vaccine is as yet unproven. They have not done a lot of animal trials. I mean, really, 
when were they going to have done that? So, I mean, this is a brand new disease to, to humanity. So they haven't been working on this for a couple of years. They've been working on it for a month or two. Mm -hmm. And so these human tests that are going on are going on concurrently with other animal efficacy trials. So they've already shown that it that the mice respond and it does the mRNA vaccine doesn't make them sick. And because it doesn't make them sick, they're, they're going to test that aspect of it in people. Now, the next question is, what kind of immune response is it going to elicit in people? We have absolutely no idea. And that after this first part of the clinical trial happens, then we'll have to do the actual efficacy trials and this and then get into manufacturer. And so if this vaccine works, if that's 18 months from now, yeah. but we started the first clinical trial, which is something exciting. Yeah. That's great. Clock's ticking at least, right? Yeah. Clock's ticking. There are, and there are a bunch of groups working on different kinds of vaccines. The mRNA idea is a, an exciting one. There are other mRNA vaccines for different uh, diseases. Uh, Kiki will be right back. <laughs> this is her usual computer crash that happens right around this time every night <laughs> there we go and she has returned <laughs> you're still muted though i'm back okay. i just have to hit all the buttons i have to unplug my usb thing and then i have to unmute myself because it moves me <sighs> yes uh, but it's been it, these mrna mrna vaccines are very exciting because once you have an RNA or, or a, a genomic sequence, you can target very specific segments of RNA to be able to create a vaccine. And it's something that can be done very quickly. It's like basically as soon as you have the genome, you can move forward on it, which uh, in, in, in the world of diseases and vaccines, the faster you can get something to market, the better. Very exciting. Yeah. yeah. Blair, I've been talking too much about COVID and all this stuff. Do you want to tell me something about, about uh, animals? Should we move into the animals? Yeah, animal? let's talk about some animals, shall let's we? Let's some fun animals. We got some po possible hope on the vaccine front there for COVID, yeah. but let's have some happy animal time. Yes. Ugh, it's time for Blair's Animal Corner. She loves our creatures. Biped, milliped, no pet at all. If you want to hear about animals, she's your girl. Except for giant pandas and squirrels. Blair. Waiting, uh, yeah, I was waiting for Justin to say, What you got, Blair? I was like, Oh, no. Oh, I see Justin. Oh, oh and then he disappeared. Then he was here. Gone. Anyway. Split second. Well, um, perhaps quite apropos, I have a story from Tokyo Metropolitan University about how Drosophila uh, fruit flies have given us the clues to potentially edit or remove traumatizing long-term memories. <laughs> What? Oh, what? So mm. after a Tell particularly rough self-isolation... <laughs> you might be able to delete this from your memory bank. So what isolation? Sure. I don't remember uh, it anymore. <laughs> well, anyway, um, and believe it or not, the big key to this mystery, lights. Let me explain. Yeah, please do. But what? <laughs> As I'm here bathed um, in them. So, as we know, Particularly shocking events, traumatizing events can be consolidated into long-term memory. And through that process, new proteins are synthesized and neuronal circuits in the brain are modified. And so that's like stored. Um, and so active maintenance is required to keep those changes in your long-term memory banks. And that protects them from the constant cellular rearrangement and renewal happening in the brain. The way that's happening, we're not entirely sure. We don't know exactly what the mechanism is behind that. Um, but knowing 
kind of the background of the basics of what's happening there with long-term memory. And also knowing that light impacts circadian rhythms, mood, cognition. These researchers in Tokyo decided, what about mem memory and light? And so for the fruit flies, for them to be able to test this on them, they had to expose them to trauma. Now, the trauma that these fruit flies experienced was something called the courtship conditioning paradigm, which is where male flies are exposed to female flies that have already mated, which means they are not having it. <laughs> and the mated females are so unreceptive that the males show stress and no longer attempt to court females. So that is apparently a very traumatic experience for them. Um, so then they took these traumatized fruit flies. They took some and they kept them in the dark for two days. And afterwards, they showed no reluctance to mate. But those that they left on the normal day-night cycle were still traumatized. Which means the environmental light somehow modified their retention of long-term memory. They also made sure to adjust their experiment to make sure this was not due to lack of sleep. So flies on a diurnal cycle were slightly sleep-deprived to match the, the flies' sleeping habits in the dark. So that it was the same. So... Um, they were able to kind of make sure that that's exactly what was going on. Then they were able to actually look molecularly what's happening. So they looked at the pigment dispersing factor PDF, which is known to be expressed in response to light. And they did find that PDF regulated the transcription of a protein called CAMP, C-A-M-P. Um, and Cyclic they, AMP. Yes. Uh -huh. And they know that that part of the brain in insects is implicated in memory and learning. So they think that this is the molecular mechanism through which light affects long-term memory. So would it be that, I mean, does this... Will this have implications basically to do with circadian rhythms and or is it something more more basic than that? Like, I don't feel happy. I'm going to turn off the lights now. <laughs> so it, it shouldn't impact emotion directly because it doesn't appear to be hormone related. It doesn't appear to be, you know, receptor related. So it doesn't appear to have to do with actual mood. And it, from what they can tell, it really looks like it is impacting their ability to remember the traumatic event. But that being said, these are flies. They do not live as long as humans. They do not have as complex memories as humans. Um, and their impulse in relation to that memory might not be as complex as things that we might be trying to impact in the human brain. So this is not to say, go sit in the dark for a few days and you'll forget something bad that happened to you. But this is to say... I can tell we, you that doesn't work. Right. It's My high school years. Probably, yeah, it's going to make worked. you worse, probably. <laughs> um, but it might mean that we have an idea of how to impact long-term memory storage in the brain with light. Hmm. It's possible that could be isolated and controlled for therapeutic use in humans. A million years from now, I don't know. It's, it's, <laughs> it's very far away, but it it is a very clear connection between exposure to light and memory. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, that's fascinating. I wonder. Yeah, I wonder at some point if they will, if there will be some aspect. I mean, I know that we're using light to control neurons these days with opto optogenetics, uh, blue light. Uh, so I wonder if there's some other aspects of neuronal control or, um, you know, for maybe not at the complex level of human behavior, right. changing memories, but in terms of research tactics to be able to study certain aspects of memory, maybe that maybe it'll 
have some influence. I don't, I don't know. This is very interesting. Yeah. Well, interesting. and then you start to wonder, should I be studying outside in natural light? Will that help me remember things? You know, so mm. oh, yeah. should I have, idea. Yeah. should I have my computer monitor and my screen pointed at me yeah. while I'm be scrolling, yeah. reading about COVID on Twitter <laughs> at 10 o'clock at night when it should be dark. <laughs> which is a whole nother point, which is a big part of your brain's memory system is knowing what to throw out and what to keep. And mm. if we're bombarding ourselves with light that we shouldn't be, are we keeping things we're not supposed to be keep? This could move back and forth in all sorts yeah. of crazy ways. So yeah. just knowing that light and memory is connected is an important first step. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, we're we're diurnal animals. We're animals impacted by circadian rhythms. It all makes sense to me. But it all makes pretty, sense. Blair's pretty. Blair's tying it all together. I still need some help, but yes. All, all, all I heard as a I geologist have... was they made incel flies and then they <laughs> fixed them, <laughs> which I, I was thought was a pretty <laughs> cool. I was thinking about that too. <laughs> Uh, Sorry, that was a little too much truth there. No, it's um, I'm a geologist, you know. I don't know anything about <laughs> DNA and mRNA and uh, circadian rhythms. I can say the words, but that's where it ends, kind of. Well, if you don't know about that, I'm guessing you might not know too much about temperature dependent sex determination, which is one of my favorite things to talk wow. about. Um, no, I do not. Uh, yeah, so that when when we have babies. They are born male or female based on whatever chromosome they get from their father because hmm. the female is XX, right? So they always right. get yep. an X chromosome, but then they the they either get an X or a Y from their father and that makes them hmm. a girl or boy, XXXY, right? But different animals have different ways of determining sex at birth. Wow. And turtles, for example... Um, the hotter it is, the more females hatch in their nest. Temperature huh. dependent sex determination, which is why, for example, since climate change, some sea turtle populations, especially on the equator, are becoming over 80% female, which wow. is causing some problems. Hmm. But this is a study not about sea turtles, but about another type of animal that has temperature dependent sex determination. That's right. It's crocodilians. The animals that have been on this planet for a very, 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 very long time. They have outlasted two extinctions, two giant extinctions. The mass extinction in the Cretaceous period, when that, you know, they killed all the dinosaurs 66 million years ago, and another one in the Eocene 33.9 million years ago that wiped out a lot of marine and other aquatic life. So these guys have figured out pretty well how to survive. That being said, they also have temperature dependent sex determination. And the warmer the eggs, the the more likely the eggs will be male. So they have the opposite differentiation of turtles. But their ability to survive in the past and their likely ability to survive this giant event of anthropogenic climate change is most likely due to their hands-on parenting approach. <laughs> this is a study from University of Bath's Milner Center for Evolution, and it all comes down to how they care for those eggs. So remember the turtles that I talked about before? They lay their mm -hmm. eggs in uh, usually a sandy nest, um, and then they just kind of leave them, and the eggs are off on their own. But... Um, with crocodilians, they actually will arrange a nest made out of deadfall and other things, <laughs> uh, rotten vegetation, and they will kind of make the perfect nest. And they're very good at curating that nest to be the right temperature. And um, they actually are not beholden to any geographical location either. Turtles usually go to the best the beach where they were laid where they were born. And so um, they, they're kind of tied to that location, but crocodilians can lay their eggs wherever and their geographical location does not impact their incubation temperatures, which most likely is because they're so particular about creating that nest in a particular way. So their temperature fluctuations for their eggs are actually way less than what the turtles experience. So they're being so deliberate about 
their nest making means that their populations aren't being impacted by climate change and their temperature dependent sex determination in the same way. Right. They actually looked across yeah. 20 different species of crocodilians across the world. They looked at the relationship between their latitude um, their body size, their reproductive data, like egg mass, clutch size and incubation temperature. And they really found that these temperatures were pretty consistent. So they're really good at what they do as parents. That's cool. I mean, it explains how they've survived so long, especially, mm -hmm. you know, through mass extinctions that did have major climate, climactic temperature changes. I mean, it, they, they have a strategy that allows them to abide like Absolutely. the dude. Right? Yeah. And when, when I talk to kids at, at work about, sea turtles they always get really upset about plastic pollution because that's always what you hear about right with sea turtles mm -hmm. is the is the plastic bags and the straws and stuff like that but i try to explain the reason that plastic pollution is such a problem for sea turtles is that um I'm, I'm always reminded of that episode of The Simpsons when Mr. Burns goes into the doctor and they try to show how he had all of the diseases and they were all trying to get through the door at the same time. And they were so it's it's like that. It's you have all these different environmental stressors. You have poaching of turtles. You have climate change impacting their their birth rates of the different sexes. And then you also have plastic pollution. And this kind of triple whammy is really devastating their population. So if you take out even one of those, their population has an opportunity to bounce back. And that's really why all these things individually and together are having this impact. So the right. idea here is that by having, not having to worry about climate change impacting the birth rate of the different sexes of crocodilians, that is one less thing to worry about where they can potentially get through this crazy thing we're going through now. And that's really what they wanted to look at is that the current rate of extinction has us leading up to a mass extinction event larger than what killed the dinosaurs. So yeah. anticipating that, researchers want to know what is going to make it. <laughs> yeah. and, What's uh, going to make it and why? What are their yeah. strategies? Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so their hope is that crocodilians will once again survive through another mass extinction because of their amazing parenting skills. That being said, there is still human-induced threats on yeah. crocodilians, mm -hmm. pollution, habitat loss, flooding, poaching. All these sorts of things are still important and still impactful. I don't want to reduce that in, in the conversation, except to say that this is one huge impact on population dynamics that they don't have to worry about. It's interesting. Yeah. I mean, I'm also thinking that they don't like to eat jellyfish. So the crocodiles also aren't going after plastic bags out in the water. But yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I but will this also is one, say you're right. It is one less thing. It's this. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. It, crocodilians, a lot of people don't realize are aside from being really cool. And that's why we want to keep them around. They're actually keystone species. They're really important mm -hmm. in their environments for a bunch of reasons. They're population control, but most of them also are slogging around in the muck. And when they do that, they dig with those big muscular mm. tails, channels that water can flow through. So aquatic animals can live in those spaces when water levels are low. So they have huge, they're, they're basically architects in their environments on top of everything else. So they're pretty important. Oh, that's really cool. Yeah. A I total random thought. I was thinking about dinosaur egg clutches and how they're, the way they put their eggs, if that had anything to do with sex determination on their, on their species as they developed their, sorry, just totally. It's, no, it's very possible. Yeah. It's Absolutely. Yeah. We don't know the answer to that. We also know though, that there are other things like ostriches, they will actually arrange their eggs very particularly so that the dominant oh, female's okay. egg is in the middle. Oh, so it is uh, least likely to get eaten or broken. Interesting. Wow. So, huh. so th there's other dynamics happening with how a nest is uh, organized as well. Hmm. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yes. Very cool. Bird nests versus mm -hmm. dinosaur nests. <gasps> And now I'm going to take us out of the animal corner of crocodilians and climate change and into the world of limb trans transplants. 
because yeah, yes <laughs> yeah. and this yes, sounds and? important please continue <laughs> yeah this is important and it's super interesting researchers publishing in science uh, science advances this last week they used a method that is employed by tumor cells to trick the body of a transplant donor, uh, the, the body of a transplant recipient mouse into accepting the limb uh, of, from a donor. So wow. these, yeah, it's just fascinating the way that they've done it. So they determined that there is a molecule that tumor cells use that is called CCL22. And CCL22 is released by tumor cells and it tricks regulatory T cells into basically recognizing the tumor cells as self and that they shouldn't be attacked. Mm. Basically saying, look, I'm like you. It's a, it's a nice, it's, I, I don't know. It's like it's a little, a little, a, a fake mask <laughs> to to trick the body. <laughs> nothing and to see so here. <laughs> nothing to see here. Exactly. <laughs> They're using the force, and it's called CCL twenty two. These and, aren't the cells that you're looking for, or they yeah, are the cells you're looking that's for. That's it. Yes. <laughs> so they synthetically created CCL twenty two. They transplanted the limbs of brown rats onto the bodies of white rats. And then they gave all of the rats, uh, they gave the rats anti-rejection drugs for the first like 20 days and then gave them an injection of, of the CCL22 in one of three doses, a low dose, a medium dose, or a high dose. Then they stopped the immunosuppressive drugs and waited to see what happens. They gave another dose of the CCL22 at about 41 days, and they found that the limbs that were in the group that got the medium dose of the, this not a drug, but the protein that was injected, the medium dose led to the donor's the limb lasted for over 200 days with absolutely no rejection after immunosuppressive drugs were stopped versus the low dose of the of the of the protein uh, the limbs fell off after and were rejected very shortly after uh, the immunosuppressive drugs stopped and uh, also interestingly in the high dose group the limb was rejected at about 60 days so there was a sweet spot there in the amount of protein that the T cells liked, that the T cells recognized. And then they wanted to see, they wanted to really find out, okay, these limbs have been on this recipient for a while. What is the body recognizing? And so then they transplanted, they did skin grafts from other naive mice that had not been involved in this at all and skin grafts from the bodies of the brown the brown uh, mouse dro donors and the body rejected the skin grafts from the the mice that they hadn't recognized as self and they accepted the skin grafts from the the owner of the limb that they had received wow yeah, so the immune cells in the body started recognizing started started recognizing the cells in the limb as self and uh, they they lasted for a very significant period of time. So they're calling this they're calling them recruitment microparticles is the therapy that they are using that um seems to be very interesting. We don't know exactly how far this will go, whether uh, someone brought up the fact, uh, another researcher brought up the fact that in tissue from living donors, the body responds to it differently than it does tissue from deceased donors. So they don't know if there's going to be a difference in how the CCL22 works if they're looking at living versus deceased donation materials. Um, but at the same time, this is a very promising 
avenue because if you can reduce the amount of immunosuppression that goes on in transplant recipients, you're going to potentially improve their quality of life significantly. Um, but anyway, it's very sure. exciting. We did, this is just the first study and uh, who knows, maybe down the way, the immun immunosuppressive drugs will just be in there for a little while and then you'll just have to get a regular a regular shot of, of your CCL22 so that your body continues recognizing your transplanted face as your own. <laughs> Could be Maybe. important. Could be important. You know, the important things in life. I hate when my face sloughs off in the morning. Um, mm -hmm. I glue it back on. Um, yeah. Huh. I mean, yeah, if so you're Nick Cage, you got to do what you got to do. That's right. That's right. Face off getting in there. Uh, let's do a couple of quick stories. But first, I just want le to let everyone know if you're interested in a Twist shirt or mug or other item of Twist merchandise, you can head to twist.org and click on the Zazzle link. That is where you can browse all sorts of wonderful goodies, items that are in our store. Quick science news. Can humans detect magnetic fields? Pigeons the, an <laughs> the answer, the answer is kind of yes, but we don't know it. Mm. So there's a new study out in a journal called eNeuro, which is available to uh, the public. So you can you can uh, read the whole study. Researchers uh, set up a very elaborate system in which to test their in which to test their their question of whether or not the brain itself, whether neurological signals within the brain respond to uh, magnetic fields. They put people on a non-magnetic chair on an isolated floor in a room with acoustic panels, merit oh coils that was wrapped in a Faraday cage <laughs> with Whoa. an EEG machine to measure their brain, brain <laughs> activity. And they found that when they turned on magnetic fields in certain directions that uh, corresponded to nodding the head or turning it from side to side, uh, that the brain, the act activation of the brain changed accordingly. And it had very specific activation changes in response to the changes of the magnetic fields. However, the people who were sitting there in the box wrapped in a Far Faraday cage, mm. they had no clue. Everybody, everybody who came out said, what magnetic field? I didn't notice anything. Mm. Nobody noticed anything, but their brains did. So what's going on and why? Mm. Is it simply that the magnetic fields are uh, affecting the, electro, uh, the electric currents, electrochemical currents in the brain? Is it simply some kind of capacitive effect? Or is it that there are little magnetite particles in our brains that are responding as some kind of evolutionary holdover from the past. Well, what makes magnetic fields? Like everything, right? Like this is how, that's how sharks figure out where animals are under the sand and stuff like that, right? Is electromagnetic fields and stuff, right? Is that thing? Yeah, well, the so earth has electromagnetic fields because of our, the dynamo in its center. Um, so there's that big magnetic yeah. field, uh, but then uh, live, yeah, living, living Just the beings. heartbeat makes one, right? So, mm -hmm. so yeah. that's what I'm wondering is if you know right how hand rule around uh, electrical wires, right? You, you can, can you can you kind can of tell, you can kind of tell when someone's mm -hmm. like looking at you behind your back. <laughs> that's the kind of thing I'm wondering about is, is if this is an evolutionary thing to know where other living things are in relation to you. It's like a mm. six set. I know that's like a very far jump, but I'm just, I'm feeling like since it is, life is an electromagnetic field, that it could be a subconscious thing that our, our bodies and our brains are just aware of because yeah. of that. I guess, the, I mean, I know they talk about pigeons tracking in the magnetic field, but I, the question is like, what's that sense organ that they have that we don't, or sharks have, um, which is the other one, and like, you know, or mm -hmm. it, or is it one of those like vestigial things, like 
Maybe we used to be able to detect a magnetic field to some sense, but it has long since disappeared because we don't, yeah. it's not our primary, you know, we have eyes that are binocular vision and, and uh, hearing, which override any of that past sense. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. But it's interesting. But yeah, it's very interesting. Apparently we can perceive them. So what does this mean? And what else do we need to learn, right? What's going on there? And, you know, as we are in my, my last story for the night, as we are in this very anxiety inducing period of time in society, uh, I think this particular study is particularly apropos. Uh, parent based treatment as efficacious as cognitive behavioral therapy for childhood anxiety. Basically, this study found that if your kid is anxious, it's just as good for the parents to go to therapy <laughs> mm. to treat it sense. as, as sure. it is for the kids because they find that very often, hey, it's the parents who are perpetuating cycles that induce anxiety in their children. Mm -hmm. Well, and as an educator, I, I can also speak to, you know, modeling proper technique or, around parents to try to, you know, mm -hmm encourage them to change, you know, or try something new with the way that they respond to certain things that their child does. So I could see how this is similar, how if you're, if you're modeling how to respond to anxiety as a, a therapist to an adult, that then they can kind of use that to model to the child too. Yeah. Yeah. So if you're, if your child's anxious and then you get anxious from your child, then you're just building on that like a, wave on a wave, right? So if you can model the calm, I would say, they can pick up that calm or try to, um, yeah, pull it together. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Pull it together. Blair, what are your last quick stories here? Oh, you know, just uh, Legos live a long time. Um, yeah, especially in my house. Yes, well. <laughs> on the floor where I step on them. Yeah, yeah. University of Plymouth asked the question we've all wanted to ask. <laughs> How long does a Lego brick last in the ocean? Oh, they they did forever. this. Um, I have some issues with the methodology, but ultimately they measured the mass of individual bricks that they found on beaches mm -hmm. and they used them um, in X-ray fluorescence spectrometry to figure out the age of the individual pieces based on the elements that were used at particular decades in the mm -hmm. creation of Legos. And then they used items that were still in package. If you have those Legos from the 70s and 80s still in their packages, it could be mm -hmm. used for science um, to weigh them against these ones that they found on the beaches. And they found that they think that Legos can last anywhere between 100 and 1300 years in the ocean. And that seems low to me. <laughs> That's it's, great. It's hard wow. plastic. Uh, yeah. Because then the they're problem. just Legos and then they're not being microplastic. They're just being Legos in the ocean. Right. Yeah. So th my problem with that mainly being, you know, I could talk about this forever, but quick news. My main problem being that this is only a 50 year old Lego that they're testing and degradation is not always linear. Sometimes mm. it's asymptotic sometimes, you know, so how do right. you, how can you model this mathematically to know how long something is going to last when you're looking at the course of 1300 years based on a 50 year degradation? Mm. I, Anyway, Legos last a long time. I will also throw out there that Legos are looking at making hemp or other plant-based plastics to be released by 2030. So they are looking into this. It's a pretty Instead cool Instead of oil-based. Yeah. yeah, so that right. it could degrade if it ended up in nature. Um, well, I mean, plastic is plastic when it's plastic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, but wow. as we know, there's there's corn based yes. plastic, there's potato based plastic, and these things we know are better. So no. it's yeah, the, the more well, we it, no a... no actually no. So like there's the there are the potato starches that are make that make plastic like products that are meant to biodegrade, mm -hmm. and then there is plastic that is made from soy, from corn, from oil from you know hemp it it all gets turned into these polymers that 
become plastic. It's just, I think the big issue, it's not what it turns into when it degrades, because once it's plastic, it is the molecule that is used for that plastic based on the long chain poly polymer that's in play. It's where it comes from. Is it coming from oil? Is it coming from soy? Is it coming from hemp? It, where is it coming from? I think that is the bigger issue. Right. Yeah. I think there's, yeah, there's a few steps along the supply chain that are concerns yep. about how it's being made and if there's byproducts, but I, isn't there also a difference in the, in potential inhibiting in when it gets into animals, things like that, uh, hormone pathways and things like that, that they can be different I don't know. depending I don't, on. I mean, as far as I'm aware, it's the, if it's, it's the, it's the molecule. What is the molecule okay. that you're, okay. that you're dealing with? What is, I mean, plastic is a very broad category. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, what is the specific molecule that Lego needs to use to make its Legos so that they're durable and can last for 1300 years in the ocean? Right. <laughs> is, isn't that the other side that, um, it's also like how long it lasts. I mean, if it was any plastic, but it only lasted, let's say, hits water and it lasts a day right. and totally dissolves. I mean, that would be great in some ways. I mean, unless it's releasing some other byproduct. Um, right. Uh, but I would right. think that the, how long it can last before it deteriorates is also that other thing. Because if it, you know, if everything, if all the plastics hit the ocean water and just and dissolved, no problem per se, unless it was releasing some some other chem, sure. some other byproduct yeah. that was within the plastic itself. Well, and what right. does dissolve mean? Sure. Yeah. 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 Well, it breaks right? down so, into other chemicals, yeah, which whole, then can be yeah. picked up in other ways. But yeah. in terms of that, like microplastic issue and mm -hmm. you know, little bits that can then get into lungs and be internalized as opposed to being flushed out or, um, yeah. Well, anyway, uh, Legos last a long time. And then, uh, my last, my last story is, uh, is less of late breaking news and more just I want to leave everyone with some good news mm. while we're hearing all the bad news all day, every day while we're stuck in our homes. This is actually from goodnewsnetwork.org and they um, compiled 10 stories of good news relating to COVID-19. The first we already talked about, which is the vaccine that was delivered to volunteers in Seattle that's uh, underway. Two distilleries across the United States are making their own free hand sanitizer to give away for free. <laughs> yes. Three air pollution plummets in cities with high rates of quarantine. And I saw today dolphins are in Venice right now, which is crazy. Mm. And the canals. People aren't in boats in the canals, so the dolphins are. Yeah. yeah. Four, John, Johns Hopkins researcher says antibodies from recovered COVID patents, patients could help protect people at risk, as we talked about before. Five, South Korean outbreak is abating as recoveries outnumber new infections. It's the, I think Goodness. the fourth day in a row. Six, China celebrates several milestones of recovery after temporary hospitals close and parks reopen. Wow. Seven Australian researchers are testing two drugs as potential cures. Eight, this is just more social fun stuff. Uber Eats is supporting the restaurant industry by waiving delivery fees for 100,000 restaurants. It's livelihood to a lot of people out there. They're helping out with that. Yeah. Nine, Dutch and Canadian researchers are reporting additional breakthrough research on treating the virus. And 10, you can Google ways that you can help people and businesses during the outbreak. So while you're stuck at home, if you're not working 12 hour days from home, if you have some free time, there's lots of things you can do from home to help. So cool. there you go. A little bit of good news before you guys all go and open up your browsers and see all the bad news again. <laughs> No, I'm going to do the Google good search. Yeah. I'm going I'm going to Google for good. At least, at least one a day, right? One one good search a day. Yes. That's right. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and I can add that I'm opening up a new line of dinosaur style personal protection equipment. There we go. Yeah. So that you can be entertained while you're in the hospital. Perfect. I do appreciate that. <laughs> yes. Oh, we've come to the end of another show. I hope all of you are staying well and finding the positive linings in all of all of this. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed the show. If you did, 
share it with a friend. Time for some shout outs. Fada, thank you for your help on the social media, on show notes, for the great challah bread that you gave me this week. That was amazing. Gord, thank you for manning the chat room. And Identity4, thank you for recording the show. It just, all these, this help cannot be done without you. I'd also like to thank the Burroughs Welcome Fund and our Patreon sponsors for their generous support. Thank you to Paul Disney, Ed Dyer, Stu Pollock, Andrew Swanson, Craig Landon, Ed, Philip Shane, Ken Hayes, Charlene Henry, Joshua Fury, Steve DeBell, Alex Wilson, Tony Steele, Richard Porter, Mark Mazaros, Bob Calder, Jack Matthew Litwin, Jason Roberts, Bill K. Arc Knapp, Richard Brian Condren, Dave Neighbor, Mark Hessenflow, Ashley Doyle, Maddie Perrin, Ben Bignell, Justin Taylor P.S., Josiah Zayner, Howard Tan, Donald Mundus, Zara Forfar, Dan K, Matt Bass, Darwin Hannon, Patrick Perrick, Beccararo, Gene Tellier, John Gridley, Corinne Benton, Adam LaJoy, Sarah Chavis, Rodney Lewis, Tiffany Boyd, Mountain Sloth, Seth Gradney, Stephen Alberon, John Ratnaswamy, Dave Friedel, Daryl Myshak, Paul Ronovich, Sue Doster, Dave Wilkinson, Noodles, Kevin Reardon, Christoph Zuknarek, Ulysses at Ulysses Adkins. RTM, Rick Ramis, Paul, John McKee, Jason Olds, Brian Carrington, Christopher Dreyer, Lisa Suzuki, Jim Derpo, Greg Riley, Sean Lamb, Steve Leisman, Kurt Larson, Rudy Garcia, Marjorie Geary S, Robert Greg Briggs, Brendan Minish, Christopher Rappin, Flying Out, Aaron Luth, and Matt Sutter, Kevin Parachan, Byron Lee, and EO. Thank you all for your generous support. We really could not do this without you. And we understand times are getting difficult at the moment, and we appreciate your support even more. If you would like to support us on uh, us on Patreon, that's right. They, if you would like to, if you need information, visit patreon.com slash this week in science. On next week's show, we will be back on Wednesday at 8 p.m. Pacific time broadcasting live from our YouTube and Facebook channels and from twist.org slash live. Hey, want to listen to us as a podcast? Lots of time for podcasts these days. <laughs> Just search for This Week in Science wherever podcasts are found. If you enjoyed the show, get your friends to subscribe as well. For more information on anything you've heard here today, show notes and links to stories will be available on our website, twist.org. And you can also sign up for our newsletter. You can also contact us directly. You can email Kirsten at Kirsten at thisweekinscience.com, Justin at twistminion at gmail.com, or Blair me at Blair Baz at twist.org. Just put twist T W I S somewhere in that subject line or your email will surely be spam filtered into oblivion. You can also ping us on Twitter where we are at twist science at Dr. Kiki at Jackson fly and at Blair's menagerie. We love your feedback. If there's a topic you would like us to address, or a suggestion for an interview, please let us know. We'll be back here next week, and we hope you'll join us again for more great science news. Oh, and if you've learned anything from the show, remember it's all in your head. <laughs> This week in science, it's the end of the world. So I'm setting up shop, got my banner unfurled. It says the scientist is in, I'm gonna sell my advice. Show them how to stop the robots with a simple device. I'll reverse global warming with a wave of my hand. And all it'll cost you is a couple of grand. This week's science is coming your way. So everybody listen to what I say. I use the scientific method for all that it's worth. And I'll broadcast my opinion all over the earth. Cause it's this week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 I've got one disclaimer and it shouldn't be news. That what I say may not represent your views. But I've done the calculations and I've got a plan. If you listen to the science, you may just get understand. That we're not trying to threaten your philosophy. We're just trying to save the world from Jeopardy. 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 And this week in science is coming your way. 
So everybody listen to everything we say And if you use our methods instead of rolling a die We may rid the world of toxoplasma God the eye Cause it's this week in science This week in science this week in science, 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 science. This week in science, this week in science, this week in science, science, science. I've got a laundry list of items I want to address From stopping global hunger to dredging Loch Ness I'm trying to promote more rational thought And I'll try to answer any question you've got So how can I ever see the changes I seek When I can only set up shop one hour a week? This week in science is coming your way You better just listen to what we say And if you learn anything from the words that we said Then please just remember it's all in your head Cause it's this week in science This week in science This week in science Science, 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 science. This week in science This week in science This week in science Science, 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 science. This week in science, 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 this week in science. And we've come to the after show. <laughs> Justin, where are you? I know. Oh, Justin's in the chat. I've seen him in the chat. He never made it. He he oh, wow. had a he had a quick cameo with his well lit bus in the background. <laughs> yeah, he has lots of string lights in that bus. It's cute. It did look cute. Yeah, yeah. For a quick moment, so somehow the internet was not agreeing. I don't know what aspect hmm. wasn't playing nicely, and. And no, you don't need 5G, Justin. Nobody has 5G. That isn't a thing yet. It's a myth. It's a myth. That's right. It's yeah. not a thing. Yeah, I read something somewhere that like a lot of their, like Apple and some others, they're like, we have 5G, but they don't. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I did. See. <laughs> Anything have, like, be 5G. Yeah. My post-it note is 5G. There you go. Yeah, so right. I put 5Gs on it. My 5G uh, post-it you know. note. There we go. <laughs> Life hack. <laughs> and then I put it on my phone and I say, see, I've got 5G on the outside. 5G. Uh, my phone. 5G. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Thanks for sticking around. And Oh, yeah. Yeah. For the well, second. Half, I, yeah. I learned so much. It was great. Yay. Fantastic. Flies and lights and yeah. crocodile eggs and sex determination by temperature and yeah granting arms to other people for fun no i mean not for fun I mean <laughs> not for, for fun for, for science, Just <laughs> science. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's what we do yeah, yeah that's cool. what we do that's what we do yeah once the kids stop laughing at the word sex they get pretty excited about how weird that is yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah 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 you have yeah. to kind of get over that hump first and then you try to yeah. explain it and then they go wait what <laughs> sorry yeah, huh? So really? it's always very fun. Yeah, like I'm sorry, <laughs> the temperature decides yeah. that. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And then there are other animals where they actually have three sex chromosomes, and then there are other animals where the male is the heterozygote or the the homozygote, and the female mm-hmm. is the heterozygote. It's like, oh, uh, so like uh, Komodo dragons. That's my favorite thing. Is that Komodo mm-hmm. dragons, the females. Mm-hmm are the um heterozygote so they're mm-hmm. like the equivalent of xy i think it's like yz or something like that okay. and mm-hmm. the males are the homozygote so they're i think they're zz or or yy mm-hmm. i don't remember but anyway so when the females do parthenogenesis which it is of itself an insane thing mm-hmm. that the females can clone themselves and basically have virgin birth right mm-hmm. then it yep. is always a male because that's the homozygote. So the idea uh, that it could be a genetic clone 
of the mother, but be a different sex. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Huh. So cool. And so they, I, I get, yeah. Oh boy. Too, too many questions. Uh, yeah. Or the whole, uh, sequential hermaphrodism thing where, you know, like yes. one day I'm female, no, I'm male because yes. I need to be. I mean, it's like, yes. it's really interesting. Yeah, in that but like, case, it's, it's like things are flexible. Right? Who needs I mean, sex chromosomes if you're right. a clownfish or a sheephead? Yeah. Sheephead as well. Sheephead okay. fish, yeah. uh, they go, they go opposite too, which is really interesting. So they're both fish. They both have this sequential hermaphrodism, but the, um, the clownfish, they start male and they become females when they get big. Mm. The machine pets are the opposite. So there will huh. be one dominant male in an area and a bunch of females. And then when the male dies, the biggest, oldest female becomes the male. Wow. Hmm. That's a lot to unpack. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> interesting. Hmm. Well, I think what's really interesting with all that is like, it's fascinating that we have sex chromosomes when like, we don't really need them. I mean, mm. it's like just interesting that different species, different lineages have been like, okay, we're going to do the sex chromosome thing. And then others are like, nah, we don't need that. We've yeah. got this, yeah. we've got this other way of dealing with it. Yeah. 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 There's no, uh, yeah. It, it, like they were all evolutionally viable. Right. So they just all still exist. So they're all, all potential solutions. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, Ed wants to know about um Sadie, my dog, and uh social distancing. So you're allowed to take the dog for walks. So I actually appreciate that in like all of the, the press releases about shelter in place in San Francisco and the Bay Area and all this kind of stuff. They, they say include... you can still go outside and go for a walk. <laughs> yeah. And they also always <laughs> include specific pet items, which I also now as a pet owner really appreciate because you might not think about it otherwise, but they're like, yeah, you absolutely can walk your dog. That's totally fine. Um, so yes, I, I take my dog for walks. I take myself for walks because mm -hmm. as you could probably all tell before, I'm already going insane inside. So I'm going yeah. for walks multiple times a day. Um, she cannot stay within outside of six feet of me. No, she's on my feet right now. Um, right. but we wipe down all of her paws and her belly because she's so low to the ground. Oh, um, every time we get back in. Hmm. Not it's that like because... coronavirus is like on the floor. Yeah, I know. I... I don't. I don't want her dirty paws on my couch. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> she's going to be tracking coronavirus into your house. <laughs> Yuck. Yeah, I don't know about that. Don't Although. We do run into other dogs and mm -hmm. especially we have a, we have a dog park on grounds and it's been very interesting that we'll go over there and there'll be like two or three other dogs in the dog park and all the humans, there's this like unspoken <laughs> understanding that none of us are going within six feet of each other. We're yeah, being very yeah. careful. And yeah. the yeah. dogs are like, why? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But so I threw a ball and it like went under somebody else and they got up and picked it up and threw it for the dog. So I wouldn't have to go near them. Like mm. everyone's being really good. Mm -hmm. Um, but at the same time, I'm kind of like, yeah, but like we're, we're all touching the dog. So yeah, like, uh, that's a whole nother study, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Transfer Which, for deferred transfer. As far as we know, dogs can't, dogs can't carry it. Right. But if it's, right. if, if it was, if, if I see a droplet hand, on their fur. Yeah. And then I yeah, touch the yeah, dog yeah. and then yeah, yeah. somebody else touched the dog. So yeah. yeah. So it's still, I'm still washing my hands religiously, I, but. Yeah, I know. I, I am too. I mean, I don't even want to guess uh, how many times I wash my hands a day now. It's, it's ridiculous. I mean, also I feel like, you know, like once I'm in my house, I'm probably safe, right. In terms of like, I've washed my hands and, you know, I'm with my family and, and, you know, I mean, if, if they're sick, they're sick, but, right. but maybe if one of them is like, well, I can still wash my hands and then I won't be passing it on per se or vice versa. So right. it's, it's interesting to, like you were saying, like the mail, like, well, what do I do about my mail? Like someone had to touch my mail. Right. Mm -hmm. And they're like, well, what do you do about that? And yeah. you know, <laughs> all those things. Oh, that's, that's what my kitty, my kitty is showing me her belly right now. Oh, <laughs> Needs she's to like be scritched. She's just out of arm's reach, and she's rolling around on the floor, showing me her belly. Oh boy! Yeah. I can I can show you. Here's here's oh, here. come on, don't. All right, I have to lock you so you don't rotate. Okay. There, can you see? 
There we go. Oh, oh yeah. God. Oh boy. <laughs> so she hates out. that I'm working from home. She just hates it. I know. She's like, I'm gonna lie on your feet all day yeah. long. I'm like, oh, you're up for a rude awakening whenever this stops. <laughs> um, Hold on. Yes, yeah. Uh, but also, uh, my partner works in emergency <laughs> medical services. So... Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, that's that's hard. So that's... he's on the front lines of this. Get it? <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's the other reason I'm trying to be really careful about social distancing is. I, uh, I'm not going to tell him not to go to work. So. <laughs> oh right, of course. I mean, he he's... needs to go to work more than anybody needs to go to work. He needs to go to work. So I, here I am. <laughs> yeah, we we all do the best we can, right? Yeah. Oh yes. yeah. I, I uh, dropped something off at my parents' house a couple weeks ago or last week, and I I like talked to my mom through the fence from ten feet away. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh my gosh. It I was know. so weird. It was like, okay, goodbye. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Seems odd, but I know. I mean, like the whole 18 month thing, like, you know what? If it's 18 months, it's 18 months, but it's just, just could do it. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. It's that's honestly, okay, yeah. if I may, the thing that's kind of scary for me is that I work in a cultural nonprofit. I work at a zoo. Uh -huh. oh, zoos, okay. aquariums, science museums. Yeah. They are places that also need our help now. I've seen a lot of right. posts about restaurants and stuff like that, which also, yes, 100%, those people need your support. But mm -hmm. these places that physically can't be open to the public, yeah. but have people on their payroll, like myself, hello. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. also, in the case of aquariums and zoos, have animals that we have to feed and care for. Yeah. Means right. That you know, normally we depend on our visitors to help pay for that. We're nonprofits, mm -hmm. but um, they, you know, we also count on memberships and stuff like that, and donations. And so, if if you have it, go go move go over to those people's websites. I know a lot of mm -hmm. cultural institutions are putting up free materials to help mm -hmm. teach your kids at home and all this kind of yeah. stuff. And yeah. if you can support them in turn, it's, it's a it's a really cool thing to do because. Yeah. If, if we're mm -hmm. really closed down for 18 months, yeah. it's going to be tough for all of these cultural institutions to stay afloat for 18 oh months gosh. without visitors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, just, yeah, you can't you can't really turn off all the lights, right? I mean, or turn down the heat. Oh. You've got animals you have to mm -hmm. keep healthy and feed. And, oh, yeah, I want to show you my, my pet dog. Oh, yeah. That, this, is the, this is Spot. <laughs> you know, um, oh good he's pretty feisty um, yeah yeah but you know uh he's he, he does like his his petting and stuff like that you don't let um, him lick your face i don't think did you I, you get it you get him from boston boston he, dynamics he never licks my face I, I i i can't reveal that but maybe um maybe yes. <laughs> maybe um yeah uh yeah uh jpl participated along with a bunch of other uh, a group a team group in the subterranean robot challenge where they basically cool. um so they have all these things like um different challenges one was like a driving challenge is like can you make an automated car mm -hmm. um another one was like a disaster challenge where you make a robot would like go through a disaster area with like pipes falling down and can you move them to the side and this one was like going underground into like a mine shaft or something and and search for objects and then have robots like go out of the line of sight and still keep driving automatically and operating and then come back and transmit like what they found um and uh jpl with mit and case and a bunch of other people um won first place so that was pretty exciting but they they literally like they went through one round and then boston dynamics give them spot and we took spot and we're like oh here here's our here's our findings tracking software and and hardware stuck it on top and we sent it in and we won up first place because of pretty much because of that we like wow. went, like spots really good about walking over things and going yeah. downstairs. And one of the big challenges was going downstairs. Mm -hmm. And spot was just like, looks, looks, walks right down, no problem. The other robots really struggled. Um, wow. So it was, anyways, uh, it was really kind of cool. Um, but anyways, they they brought them out into one of the auditorium, so we got to like walk around them and uh, you know play with spot. And it and actually, it's you know it's basically like a headless dog. 
So it's kind of weird. That's so weird. <laughs> I've yeah. always thought that about, about Big Dog, too. Like, I, yeah. I want to put a head on it so bad so yeah. I know where Please? to look. <laughs> I want to know where to look it in the eyes. Right, it doesn't right, matter. Right. It's front and it's back. It could be it's back and it's uh, front. It doesn't yeah. matter. So and, I and, simultaneously yeah. really want to meet these things and also know that I'll probably spend most of the time screaming if I do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, they they like it has some like automated program, and it just was like running around in a circle and doing all these like tail wag like motions, and it was cool and creepy. And like, do I sit? Do I run? Do I go forward? I don't know. <laughs> mm -hmm. But um, it's always like, I always find it interesting. Like they they um, you know, they tried to make the legs like like a human would be um, in terms of how the uh, the 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 knee bent, but they wound up putting it in reverse and that worked better for some reason. Um, yeah. That was a better way for them to figure out the mobility, which is always odd to me. But uh, anyways, yeah, they're really it, yeah. fascinating. The, the, the I way remember to watching motion. Yeah. I watched one of the, uh, the, I think it was the disaster response competition mm -hmm. where they had to open doors and yeah. try and, and that was the heart. It was so funny. There, there was somebody put together a compilation of all the robots in the competition trying to do this thing. And it was like one robot after another was like falling over, yeah, yeah. <laughs> not making it. And so it actually, that video made me feel a lot better about the state <laughs> of robots. <laughs> if I can close the door, I have time. I have, I have time, Thanks. yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's true. As long as the Boston Dynamic robots aren't after me. Oh yeah. my goodness, yeah. Yeah, well, they're... Way more advanced than you'd expect yeah, than you would want right. them to be. But then again, of course, uh, you'll see those videos online like, oh, this robot caught this thing out of the air. It's like, yes, that was one out of a thousand tries yeah, that it real. actually yeah, succeeded. Yeah, yeah. So like, oh, thank you. All right, good. We're uh, safe for another, I don't know, 10 days or whatever. <laughs> um, yeah. I always like to joke, um, you know, Mars is the only planet entirely inhabited by robots. Um, so we're safe in that way for a little bit. We take all our just, smart ro robots and we we send them to another planet so they can't take over. It's, yeah, it's I like to thing. think about that though. That that just like all these eventually there's gonna be so many robots on Mars that they're just gonna be passing each other. Oh, hey Carl, how's it going? You That's know, right. Yeah, like, is they have they have their we have our own Mars colony already. It's just all that, robots. That's right. It's all robots, and there'll be so many robots someday. You'll be like, like they're like humans want to land, and they're like robots. No. Yeah. This is ours. No, we're good. <laughs> Go to Europa. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're covered in weird stuff we don't want here. So just yeah, yeah, yeah. get out. Humans, you're weird. Yeah. And you're gooey. <laughs> I don't like gooey. <laughs> Anyways. I yeah. know people want to go to space, but you know, there's so much there's a good argument to be had that space is for robots. Yeah. That, that's where the robots thrive. Uh, you, you know, they, they don't breathe. That's a big help. Um, they don't need to eat per se. I mean, energy, they need energy certainly, but they don't need food. Um, they never, they never want to come back. Right. right? I mean, they, they're, they, they're happy out there yeah. they're doing their job. Yeah. Like everyone, like, you know, there's always like, Oh, the Mars Rover, why don't you bring it back? It's like, cause it was built for Mars. It is not made for earth. It would not last on earth for very I long. I can't survive I mean, here, dad. I'm not meant to be here. <laughs> You're <laughs> not my real planet. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know? Uh, yeah, so they're really, they're made, to, they, they, you know, in a sense, they love Mars, you know, I mean, it, it's, yeah. it really is a place for them. So they really, we wouldn't want to bring them back per se, other than the fact that it's super expensive and would be incredibly yeah. difficult. Um, but, uh, yeah. We'll just so bring I, back their poop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> just, that's right. We only take their excrement. That's all we can that's bring right. We'll back. just pick up their um, poop. That's good. The, yeah, it's, it's, it's a trade, right? Mm-hmm. Give us science and we'll take your poop. I don't know. Um, something like that. Uh, which one is the one that um, sings its happy birthday to itself every year? Oh, uh, Curiosity. Yeah. Oh, okay. There's um, uh, the uh, Chemin, which is the, uh, it's a X-ray diffraction instrument. Um, so basically it, it, it has a little sample container where it puts the rocks in, uh, the, 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 the ground up rock, and it, and it vibrates. And when it vibrates, they shoot x-rays through it and they can look at the different minerals, um, the, the patterns that the minerals make in, in an x-ray shape. Um, but because it's a vibrator, you know, a, a vibration object, it can, um, you know, make different tones. And so uh -huh. they 
they played essentially the right frequencies to to have it sing happy birthday. Um, so this this is what I'm wondering about though is like who <laughs> who's like oh let's let's not launch it yet let me just finish this one thing <laughs> sort of make sure that that it can sing happy birthday. It can sing happy birthday. Yeah. yeah. Um, I don't know. You know, you gotta keep yourself entertained. <laughs> Um, I, I don't know who originally thought that that was a good idea. Um, but, uh, yeah, it, it happens. Um, I just think that's very funny. That's something that someone decided <laughs> to do before. Yeah. Well, we, we do lots of things. Um, the, 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 the fun thing I like to tell is about the, the wheels on MSL on curiosity. Um, the original wheels used to have the letters JPL written on the wheel. And so, you know, when you would drive along, you'd be like, printing JPL all over the surface. Um, well, uh, someone found that out at, at, at NASA headquarters. They're like, no, 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 you can't do that labeling. We're like, okay. So instead we put a whole pattern on the wheels and the whole pattern happens to be Morse code. And it also happens to spell J P and L. Um, so <laughs> happens to we oh, trickily, uh, still print JPL on the surface all the time. <laughs> um you know but uh for fun it's 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 navigation marks we need to we needed to to calculate how far we've driven yeah no. but um you know it's okay it's fine make your mark on mars yeah yeah have you written your name on mars yet no <laughs> <laughs> not Fred from lack of trying here. yeah 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 oh right over there i licked this rock although not anymore you know because uh Social distancing, right? Yeah. Um, but anyways, um, we don't have to social like, distance yeah. from rocks. rocks yeah, it's just like rocks on Mars. I but if like... I lick a rock, and then what if someone else licks the rock? That's uh, a, yeah. Anyways, um, <laughs> sorry. That, <laughs> too that many was, people that, licking rocks. Oh too many people goodness. licking. Only actually, probably licking rock is the 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 least of the worries because the geologists are separated enough from each other that it doesn't happen. Yeah, we just can't oh, congregate that's... together. Otherwise. We might have looked the same rock. It's, it's uh, <laughs> not an improbable number. Um, almost not even jokingly. Because um, <laughs> that's what we do. Um, you know, you got to taste the minerals. It's very important. It's that, right. extra, it's that extra sense. Yeah. Um, yeah. Mm, minerally. Yep. Tastes like hematite. Mmm. Rusty tastes red. Tastes like mm. a rock. <laughs> <laughs> Mostly, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mostly that. Yeah. Mostly that. All right, I'm okay. gonna head to bed and yeah. do the do the evening things. Um, Blair, I think I'm yeah. good for tomorrow. Not tomorrow, <laughs> next week. The next day. The next. The next was one. Was that yes. was that the one that you originally weren't gonna be at? Yeah, but everything's canceled. <laughs> yeah, so. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Everything's canceled. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So I was organizing a an in person science communication conference called Science Talk. Oh, yeah, Science Talk. Then, and then we went. Oh, that's and it had a bunch of satellite events around it. So Wednesday yeah. night, it, we were going to open registration on Wednesday, and we had an event on Wednesday night, and then mm -hmm. the conference was Thursday and Friday, and we had an event on Friday night. And, and now we're like, everything mm. is canceled. But yep. I'm still doing the conference just yep. virtually now. So mm. Are that'll you be Thursday. Push? That'll be Thursday and Friday. So I should be able to do the show Wednesday night. So, well, yeah. you could also, you could cool. you could push the Wednesday night show as a Science Talk affiliate event, couldn't you? As part of the virtual, virtual conference. Sure. I yeah. remember. So That's just, right. And we it's free. It, we did it in conjunction in a live show at, at um, yeah. Alberta Rose last year in conjunction with Science Talk. So, like, there this go. could actually be a way for us to support Science Talk again. Just saying. There we go. There's a great idea, Blair. All right. Well, good night, everyone. Put it out there. Nice Thank meeting you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Had a lot of fun. That was fun. Take care. It was yeah. great to meet you tonight. Thank you so Likewise. much. Good night. Great. Good night. All right. Blair's still there. Yeah. I'm still here. Smiling, yeah. yeah. I'm gonna go to bed. I'm mean, we're gonna so go to bed. The, we're all, all gonna be things, healthy. All the things have said, like, keep to your routines while working from home. <laughs> like, it's like, and, that's the first thing that goes away when you, you're like, number one, I'm working from home. That is not my routine. Right. So, I, I recognize maybe in a week I will be ready to wake up at 5 45 and do my morning workout mm -hmm. and then get in the show and then make but i'm no <laughs> also because i've just 
there's a lot going on and i feel like i have this like low level anxiety and i need extra sleep you should let yourself sleep <laughs> so i'm yeah. taking care of myself right now <laughs> and yeah. then eventually if i can get back to normalizing my schedule i will but otherwise oh my goodness yeah i mean they the the schools are closed and so kai is home from school and his spring break was supposed to start next week so right now it's kind of like early spring break and so i'm right. finding myself oh we don't have to get him to school at eight in the morning and so i just don't get up as early as i was getting up and now i'm finding oh it's 8 30 and i'm still in bed and i don't want to get out of bed mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. My routine is my routine. Be, I think, it, I mean, because I have Kai home yeah, and Marshall's home. So, like, I usually am alone all day long. Right. <laughs> like, yes. I'm alone alone. <laughs> I am the queen of the castle. And now I'm like, there's all these people in the house and they have needs. <laughs> like, they want me to make yeah. them lunch. What is what? that? Make your own lunch. <laughs> make your Kai's own old enough. Lunch. He can make his own lunch. I know. Go make yourself um, a taco. Is he is there is there distance learning happening yet? Or is this point is it still like, uh, it's, we're figuring it out? <laughs> yeah, it's still too early. Um, uh, yeah. but I assume after probably after next week, because that next week's supposed to be spring break anyway. Mm-hmm. I figure after next week they'll do something because they've closed yeah. school for the entire month of April at this oh. point. Yeah. Oh dang. We haven't yeah. done that yet. School is closed until April twenty eighth. Wow. Well yeah. Governor Newsom did say uh he's like, I won't be surprised if school doesn't come back till the fall. Mm-hmm. It's like suddenly uh... everybody <laughs> suddenly all these children just they don't have get to go up a grade. <laughs> Look at you doing third well, grade again. I feel like that's oh, oh gosh. <laughs> well, that's yeah. a, a, so I'm trying to develop things that teachers can use right now with my yeah. time at home. We'll see, but uh, I have a lot of friends that are teachers. I see them on social media setting up their own little distance learning nook and trying to have regularly scheduled class time once a day where they get to meet up with the kids virtually. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's, it's an interesting world, but also again, like imagine even five years ago, this happening, all these video conferencing softwares and, and the speed of internet and all this kind of stuff was not where it is now. No. And that would not even have been an option. Yeah, it's pretty amazing that the technology, that Zoom is absorbing it as well as it is right now. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that all these platforms are. Yeah, it's... Fingers crossed it stays that way. Yeah. Um... I'm trying to decide if I like my white balance or my blue (laughs) balance. (laughs) Do do I like to be rosier? Oh my goodness. Am I too Uh-oh. orange? I should go. I need to go to bed. You need to go to bed. Mm-hmm. We need to get our rest because, mm-hmm. you know, going into the dark, it will make the bad memories go away. Yes. Well. <laughs> Let's trauma. erase the bad memories. The trauma. Go to sleep. Go into the dark. That's right. Um, All right. Hopefully we'll be joined by Justin next week. Hopefully. Yes. If Justin is still, he's not, he's not around in the chat room anymore. A telephone pole or something by his bus. And yeah, well, he seemed to jump in at one point. His video was there. So I'm just, I don't know. I'm wondering if we can work on it this week, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but yeah. Well, I'm around. (laughs) Yeah. We need to be. Oh, Allie, you're watching the show. Oh, my goodness. (laughs) (laughs) That's awesome. (laughs) Uh, Allison, (laughs) she she runs Science Talk. She says, we can totally do Twist next week as a pre-Sci Talk event. Thanks, Blair. We can have a a separate chat room just for the Sci Talk attendees if they want to. That would be fun. H neck <laughs> work in overnights. Oh no, no bad memories. 
I hope yeah. everyone has a wonderful night. Um, it, was, it was a good science week. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hi, Allie. I see you in the chat room. <laughs> That's fun. I love that. I love it when I'm like, I know that person. I know that name. Hello. It's what the whole our, our twist chat room is. And more and more often I'm recognizing names in our YouTube chat room. But yeah, that's awesome. There's some, I thank people for joining us. Yeah. 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 Blair, enjoy working from home. Thank if you. you do need a conversation or anything, you know, a Zoom coffee or something, let me know. Yeah. Okay. Great. Yeah. Coffee, wine, uh -huh. something. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Let me know. Yeah. I mean, like I said, I've been training for this. Yes. It's the it's yes. the actual interacting with people that's the difficult part. No. <laughs> I was reflecting. I feel like this is when you really try you really learn who the extreme extroverts are mm -hmm. through this. Yes. Cuz it's the person who's texting you 5 times a day asking how your day's going. Hey, that's me. <laughs> I'm doing that. I'm like, hey, it's going to it's going to work. Like I took a break from um my work today just to FaceTime my mom so I could show her the dog. <laughs> so I was just like, ah! <laughs> so anyway, we're going to get through it. We are going to, we're going to look it. back on this time and hopefully we're going to go, you know, no matter what those in charge may have done or not done, communities banded together <laughs> yes and and protected those at risk and really hoping that that we can look back with pride on this time i think so i hope so mm -hmm. my fingers are crossed yep and so far i've seen very good positive things hopefully it just gets better mm -hmm. communities bonding together let's do that let's all work together to get through this together yeah okay yeah. all right and with that good night blair good night everyone good night kiki good night kiki <laughs> good night everyone thank you so much for watching the show tonight and we do hope that you stay sane yeah. stay safe yeah. stay healthy and try to find ways to put a smile on your face every day We'll see you again next week for more This Week in Science. Good night. You got to hit the button again. I keep forgetting to hit the button again. You just keep waving, Blair. Are you sure? Are you sure?